Chapters 111 through 114 of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maud. Chapter 111. Next day Philip began to work again, but the end which he had expected within a few weeks did not come. The weeks passed into months. The winter wore away, and in the parks the trees burst into bud and into leaf. A terrible lassitude settled upon Philip. Time was passing, though it went with such heavy feet, and he thought that his youth was going, and soon he would have lost it, and nothing would have been accomplished. His work seemed more aimless now that there was the certainty of his leaving it. He became skillful in the designing of costumes, and though he had no inventive faculty, acquired quickness in the adaption of French fashions to the English market. Sometimes he was not displeased with his drawings, but they always bungled them in the execution. He was amused to notice that he suffered from a lively irritation when his ideas were not adequately carried out. He had to walk warily. Whenever he suggested something original, Mr. Sampson turned it down. Their customers did not want anything outré. It was a very respectable class of business, and when you had a connection of that sort it wasn't worth while taking liberties with it. Once or twice he spoke sharply to Philip. He thought the young man was getting a bit above himself because Philip's ideas did not always coincide with his own. "'You jolly well take care, my fine young fellow, or one of these days you'll find yourself in the street.' Philip longed to give him a punch in the nose, but he restrained himself. After all, it could not possibly last much longer, and then he would be done with all these people forever. Sometimes in a comic desperation he cried out that his uncle must be made of iron. What a constitution! The ills he suffered from would have killed any decent person twelve months before. When at last the news came that the vicar was dying, Philip, who had been thinking of other things, was taken by surprise. It was in July, and in another fortnight he was to have gone for his holiday. He received a letter from Mrs. Foster saying the doctor did not give Mr. Carey many days to live, and if Philip wished to see him again he must come at once. Philip went to the buyer and told him he wanted to leave. Mr. Sampson was a decent fellow, and when he knew the circumstances made no difficulties. Philip said good-bye to the people in his department. The reason of his leaving had spread among them in an exaggerated form, and they thought he had come into a fortune. Mrs. Hodges had tears in her eyes when she shook hands with him. "'I suppose we shan't often see you again,' she said. "'I'm glad to get away from Lynn's,' he answered. It was strange, but he was actually sorry to leave these people whom he thought he had loathed, and when he drove away from the house in Harrington Street it was with no exultation. He had so anticipated the emotions he would experience on this occasion that now he felt nothing. He was as unconcerned as though he were going for a few days' holiday. "'I've got a rotten nature,' he said to himself. "'I look forward to things awfully, and then when they come I'm always disappointed.' He reached Blackstable early in the afternoon. Mrs. Foster met him at the door, and her face told him that his uncle was not yet dead. "'He's a little better today,' she said. "'He's got a wonderful constitution.' She led him into the bedroom where Mr. Carey lay on his back. He gave Philip a slight smile, in which was a trace of satisfied cunning at having circumvented his enemy once more. "'I thought it was all up with me yesterday,' he said in an exhausted voice. "'They'd all given me up, hadn't you, Mrs. Foster? You've got a wonderful constitution, there's no denying that. There's life in the old dog yet.' Mrs. Foster said that the vicar must not talk it would tire him. She treated him like a child with kindly despotism, and there was something childish in the old man's satisfaction at having cheated all their expectations. It struck him at once that Philip had been sent for, and he was amused that he had been brought on a fool's errand. If he could only avoid another of his heart attacks he would get well enough in a week or two, and he had had the attacks several times before. He always felt as if he were going to die, but he never did. They all talked of his constitution, but they, none of them, knew how strong it was. 
"'Are you going to stay a day or two? he asked Philip, pretending to believe he had come down for a holiday. "'I was thinking of it,' Philip answered cheerfully. "'A breath of sea air will do you good.' Presently Dr. Wigram came, and after he had seen the vicar talk with Philip, he adopted an appropriate manner. "'I'm afraid it is the end this time, Philip,' he said. "'It'll be a great loss to all of us. I've known him for five and thirty years.' "'He seems well enough now,' said Philip. "'I'm keeping him alive on drugs, but it can't last. It was dreadful these last few days. I thought he was dead half a dozen times.' The doctor was silent for a minute or two, but at the gate he said suddenly to Philip, "'Has Mrs. Foster said anything to you?' "'What do you mean?' they're very superstitious these people she's got hold of an idea that he's got something on his mind and he can't die till he gets rid of it and he can't bring himself to confess it philip did not answer and the doctor went on of course it's nonsense he's led a very good life he's done his duty and he's been a good parish priest and i'm sure we shall all miss him he can't have anything to reproach himself with i very much doubt whether the next vicar will suit us half so well for several days Mr. Carey continued without change. His appetite, which had been excellent, left him, and he could eat little. Dr. Wigram did not hesitate now to still the pain of the neuritis which tormented him, and that, with the constant shaking of his palsied limbs, was gradually exhausting him. His mind remained clear. Philip and Mrs. Foster nursed him between them. She was so tired by the many months during which he had been attentive to all his wants that Philip insisted on sitting up with the patient so that she might have her night's rest. He passed the long hours in an armchair so that he should not sleep soundly and read by the light of shaded candles the thousand and one nights. He had not read them since he was a little boy and they brought back his childhood to him. Sometimes he sat and listened to the silence of the night. When the effects of the opiate wore off Mr. Carey grew restless and kept him constantly busy. At last, early one morning, when the birds were chattering noisily in the trees, he heard his name called. He went up to the bed. Mr. Carey was lying on his back with his eyes looking at the ceiling. He did not turn them on Philip. Philip saw that sweat was on his forehead, and he took a towel and wiped it. "'Is that you, Philip?' the old man asked. Philip was startled because the voice was suddenly changed. It was hoarse and low. So would a man speak if he was cold with fear. Yes, do you want anything? There was a pause, and still the unseeing eyes stared at the ceiling. Then a twitch passed over the face. I think I'm going to die, he said. Oh, what nonsense, cried Philip. You're not going to die for years. Two tears were wrung from the old man's eyes they moved Philip horribly. His uncle had never betrayed any particular emotion in the affairs of life, and it was dreadful to see them now, for they signified a terror that was unspeakable. "'Send for Mr. Simmons,' he said. "'I want to take the communion.' Mr. Simmons was the curate. "'Now?' asked Philip. "'Soon, or else it'll be too late.' Philip went to awake Mrs. Foster, but it was later than he thought, and she was up already. He told her to send the gardener with a message, and he went back to his uncle's room. "'Have you sent for Mr. Simmons?' "'Yes.' There was a silence. Philip sat by the bedside and occasionally wiped the sweating forehead. "'Let me hold your hand, Philip,' the old man said at last. Philip gave him his hand, and he clung to it as to life for comfort in his extremity. Perhaps he had never really loved anyone in all his days, but now he turned instinctively to a human being. His hand was wet and cold. It grasped Philip's with feeble, despairing energy. The old man was fighting with the fear of death, and Philip thought that all must go through that. Oh, how monstrous it was, and they could believe in a God that allowed his creatures to suffer such a cruel torture. He had never cared for his uncle, and for two years he had longed every day for his death but now he could not overcome the compassion that filled his heart. What a price it was to pay for being other than the beasts! They remained in silence broken only once by a low inquiry from Mr. Carey. "'Hasn't he come yet?' 
At last the housekeeper came in softly to say that Mr. Simmons was there. He carried a bag in which were his surplice and his hood. Mrs. Foster brought the communion plate. Mr. Simmons shook hands silently with Philip, and then with professional gravity went to the sick man's side. Philip and the maid went out of the room. Philip walked round the garden all fresh and dewy in the morning. The birds were singing gaily. The sky was blue, but the air, salt-laden, was sweet and cool. The roses were in full bloom. The green of the trees, the green of the longs, was eager and brilliant. Philip walked, and as he walked he thought of the mystery which was proceeding in that bedroom. It gave him a peculiar emotion. Presently Mrs. Foster came out to him and said that his uncle wished to see him. The curate was putting his things back into the black bag. The sick man turned his head a little and greeted him with a smile. Philip was astonished for there was a change in him, an extraordinary change. His eyes had no longer the terror-stricken look, and the pinching of his face had gone. He looked happy and serene. "'I'm quite prepared now,' he said, and his voice had a different tone in it. "'When the Lord sees fit to call me, I am ready to give my soul into his hands.' Philip did not speak. He could see that his uncle was sincere." It was almost a miracle. He had taken the body and blood of his Savior, and they had given him strength so that he no longer feared the inevitable passage into the night. He knew he was going to die. He was resigned. He only said one more thing. I shall rejoin my dear wife. It startled Philip. He remembered with what a callous selfishness his uncle had treated her how obtuse he had been to her humble, devoted love. The curate, deeply moved, went away, and Mrs. Foster, weeping, accompanied him to the door. Mr. Carey, exhausted by his effort, fell into a light doze, and Philip sat down by the bed and waited for the end. The morning wore on, and the old man's breathing grew stertorous. The doctor came and said he was dying. He was unconscious and he pecked feebly at the sheets. He was restless and he cried out. Dr. Wigram gave him a hypodermic injection. It can't do any good now. He may die at any moment. The doctor looked at his watch and then at the patient. Philip saw that it was one o'clock. Dr. Wigram was thinking of his dinner. It's no use your waiting, he said. There's nothing I can do, said the doctor. When he was gone Mrs. Foster asked Philip if he would go to the carpenter, who was also the undertaker, and tell him to send up a woman to lay out the body. "'You want a little fresh air,' she said. "'It'll do you good.' The undertaker lived half a mile away. When Philip gave him his message he said, "'When did the poor old gentleman die?' Philip hesitated. It occurred to him that it would seem brutal to fetch a woman to wash the body while his uncle still lived and he wondered why Mrs. Foster had asked him to come. They would think he was in a great hurry to kill the old man off. He thought the undertaker looked at him oddly. He repeated the question. It irritated Philip. It was no business of his. When did the vicar pass away? Philip's first impulse was to say that it had just happened, but then it would seem inexplicable if the sick man lingered for several hours. He reddened and answered awkwardly. Oh, he isn't exactly dead yet. The undertaker looked at him in perplexity, and he hurried to explain. Mrs. Foster is all alone, and she wants a woman there. You understand, don't you? He may be dead by now. The undertaker nodded. Oh, yes, I see. I'll send someone up at once. When Philip got back to the vicarage, he went up to the bedroom. Mrs. Foster rose from her chair by the bedside. He's just as he was when you left, she said. She went down to get herself something to eat, and Philip watched curiously the process of death. There was nothing human now in the unconscious being that struggled feebly. Sometimes a muttered ejaculation issued from the loose mouth. The sun beat down hotly from a cloudless sky, but the trees in the garden were pleasant and cool. It was a lovely day. A bluebottle buzzed against the window pane. Suddenly there was a loud rattle. It made Philip start. It was horribly frightening. 
of movement passed through the limbs, and the old man was dead. The machine had run down. The blue bottle buzzed noisily against the window pane. End of chapter 111. Chapter 112. Josiah Graves, in his masterful way, made arrangements becoming but economical for the funeral, and when it was over, came back to the vicarage with Philip. The will was in his charge, and with a due sense of the fitness of things, he read it to Philip over an early cup of tea. It was written on half a sheet of paper and left everything Mr. Carey had to his nephew. There was the furniture, about eighty pounds at the bank, twenty shares in the ABC Company, a few in Alsop's Brewery, some in the Oxford Music Hall, and a few more in a London restaurant. They had been bought under Mr. Gray's direction, and he told Philip with satisfaction, "'You see, people must eat, they will drink, and they want amusement. You're always safe if you put your money in what the public thinks necessities.' His words showed a nice discrimination between the grossness of the vulgar, which he deplored but accepted, and the finer taste of the elect. Altogether in investments there was about five hundred pounds, and to that must be added the balance at the bank and what the furniture would fetch. It was riches to Philip. He was not happy, but infinitely relieved. Mr. Graves left him after they had discussed the auction which must be held as soon as possible, and Philip sat himself down to go through the papers of the deceased. The Reverend William Carey had prided himself on never destroying anything, and there were piles of correspondence dating back for fifty years and bundles upon bundles of neatly docketed bills. He had kept not only letters addressed to him, but letters which himself had written. There was a yellow packet of letters which he had written to his father in the forties when, as an Oxford undergraduate, he had gone to Germany for the long vacation. Philip read them idly. It was a different William Carey from the William Carey he had known, and yet there were traces in the boy which might, to an acute observer, have suggested the man. The letters were formal and a little stilted. He showed himself strenuous to see all that was noteworthy, and he described with a fine enthusiasm the castles of the Rhine. The falls of Schaffhausen made him offer reverent thanks to the all-powerful creator of the universe, whose works were wondrous and beautiful, and he could not help thinking that they who lived in sight of this handiwork of their blessed Maker must be moved by the contemplation to lead pure and holy lives. Among some bills Philip found a miniature which had been painted of William Carey soon after he was ordained. It represented a thin young curate with long hair that fell over his head in natural curls, with dark eyes, large and dreamy, and a pale, ascetic face. Philip remembered the chuckle with which his uncle used to tell him of the dozens of slippers which were worked for him by adoring ladies. The rest of the afternoon and all the evening Philip toiled through the innumerable correspondence. He glanced at the address and at the signature, then tore the letter in two, and threw it into the washing-basket by his side. Suddenly he came upon one signed Helen. He did not know the writing. It was thin, angular, and old-fashioned. It began, My dear William, and ended, Your affectionate sister. Then it struck him that it was from his own mother. He had never seen a letter of hers before, and her handwriting was strange to him. It was about himself. My dear William, Stephen wrote to you to thank you for your congratulations on the birth of our son and your kind wishes to myself. Thank God we are both well, and I am deeply thankful for the great mercy which has been shown me. Now that I can hold a pen, I want to tell you and dear Louisa myself how truly grateful I am to you both for all your kindness to me now and always since my marriage. I am going to ask you to do me a great favor. Both Stephen and I wish you to be the boy's godfather, and we hope that you will consent. I know I am not asking a small thing, for I am sure you will take the responsibilities of the position very seriously, but I am especially anxious that you should undertake this office, because you are a clergyman as well as the boy's uncle. I am very anxious for the boy's welfare, 
and I pray God night and day that he may grow into a good, honest, and Christian man. With you to guide him, I hope that he will become a soldier in Christ's faith and be all the days of his life God-fearing, humble, and pious. Your affectionate sister, Helen. Philip pushed the letter away and, leaning forward, rested his face on his hands. It deeply touched and at the same time surprised him. He was astonished at its religious tone which seemed to him neither mawkish nor sentimental. He knew nothing of his mother, dead now for nearly twenty years, but that she was beautiful and it was strange to learn that she was simple and pious. He never thought of that side of her. He read again what she said about him, what she expected and thought about him. He had turned out very differently. He looked at himself for a moment. Perhaps it was better that she was dead. Then a sudden impulse caused him to tear up the letter. Its tenderness and simplicity made it seem peculiarly private. He had a queer feeling that there was something indecent in his reading what exposed his mother's gentle soul. He went on with the vicar's dreary correspondence. A few days later he went up to London and for the first time for two years entered by day the hall of St. Luke's Hospital. He went to see the secretary of the medical school. He was surprised to see him and asked Philip curiously what he had been doing. Philip's experiences had given him a certain confidence in himself and a different outlook upon many things. Such a question would have embarrassed him before, but now he answered coolly, with a deliberate vagueness which prevented further inquiry, that private affairs had obliged him to make a break in the curriculum. He was now anxious to qualify as soon as possible. The first examination he could take was in midwifery and the diseases of women, and he put his name down to be a clerk in the ward devoted to feminine ailments. Since it was holiday time there happened to be no difficulty in getting a post as obstetric clerk. He arranged to undertake that duty during the last week of August and the first two of September. After this interview Philip walked through the medical school, more or less deserted, for the examinations at the end of the summer session were all over, and he wandered along the terrace by the riverside. His heart was full. He thought that now he could begin a new life, and he would put behind him all the errors, follies, and miseries of the past. The flowing river suggested that everything past was passing always and nothing mattered. The future was before him rich with possibilities. He went back to Blackstable and busied himself with the setting up of his uncle's estate. The auction was fixed for the middle of August when the presence of visitors for the summer holidays would make it possible to get better prices. Catalogues were made out and sent to the various dealers in second-hand books at Turkenbury, Maidstone, and Ashford. One afternoon Philip took it into his head to go over to Turkenbury and see his old school. He had not been there since the day when, with relief in his heart, he had left it with the feeling that thenceforward he was his own master. It was strange to wander through the narrow streets of Turkenbury, which he had known so well for many years. He looked at the old shops still there, still selling the same things, the booksellers with school books, highest works, and the latest novels in one window, and photographs of the cathedral and of the city in the other, the game shop with its cricket bats, fishing tackle, tennis rackets, and footballs, the tailor from whom he had got clothes all through his boyhood, and the fishmonger where his uncle, whenever he came to Turkenbury, bought fish. He wandered along the sordid street in which, behind a high wall, lay the red brick house which was the preparatory school. Further on was the gateway that led into King's School, and he stood in the quadrangle round which were the various buildings. It was just four, and the boys were hurrying out of school. He saw the masters in their gowns and mortarboards, and they were strange to him. It was more than ten years since he had left, and many changes had taken place. He saw the headmaster. He walked slowly down from the schoolhouse to his own, talking to a big boy who Philip supposed was in the sixth. He was little changed, tall, cadaverous, romantic as Philip remembered him, with the same wild eyes, 
but the black beard was streaked with gray now, and the dark sallow face was more deeply lined. Philip had an impulse to go up and speak to him, but he was afraid he would have forgotten him, and he hated the thought of explaining who he was. Boys lingered talking to one another, and presently some who had hurried to change came out to play fives. Others straggled out in twos and threes and went out of the gateway. Philip knew they were going up to the cricket ground. Others again went into the precincts to bat at the nets. Philip stood among them a stranger. One or two gave him an indifferent glance, but visitors attracted by the Norman staircase were not rare and excited little attention. Philip looked at them curiously. He thought with melancholy of the distance that separated him from them, and he thought bitterly how much he had wanted to do and how little done. It seemed to him that all those years, vanished beyond recall, had been utterly wasted. The boys, fresh and buoyant, were doing the same things that he had done. It seemed that not a day had passed since he left the school, and yet in that place where at least by name he had known everybody, now he knew not a soul. In a few years these two, others taking their place, would stand alien as he stood but the reflection brought him no solace. It merely impressed upon him the futility of human existence. Each generation repeated the trivial round. He wondered what had become of the boys who were his companions. They were nearly thirty now. Some would be dead, but others were married and had children. They were soldiers and parsons, doctors, lawyers. They were staid men who were beginning to put youth behind them. Had any of them made such a hash of life as he? He thought of the boy he had been devoted to. It was funny. He could not recall his name. He remembered exactly what he looked like. He had been his greatest friend. But his name would not come back to him. He looked back with amusement on the jealous emotions he had suffered on his account. It was irritating not to recollect his name. He longed to be a boy again like those he saw sauntering through the quadrangle so that, avoiding his mistakes, he might start fresh and make something more out of life. He felt an intolerable loneliness. He almost regretted the penury which he had suffered during the last two years since the desperate struggle merely to keep body and soul together had deadened the pain of living. In the sweat of thy brow shalt thou earn thy daily bread. It was not a curse upon mankind but the bomb which reconciled it to existence. But Philip was impatient with himself. He called to mind his idea of the pattern of life. The unhappiness he had suffered was no more than part of a decoration which was elaborate and beautiful. He told himself strenuously that he must accept with gaiety everything, dreariness and excitement, pleasure and pain, because it added to the richness of the design. He sought for beauty consciously, and he remembered how even as a boy he had taken pleasure in the Gothic cathedral as one saw it from the precincts. He went there and looked at the massive pile, gray under the cloudy sky, with the central tower that rose like the praise of men to their god. But the boys were batting at the nets, and they were lissom and strong and active. He could not help hearing their shouts and laughter. The cry of youth was insistent, and he saw the beautiful thing before him, only with his eyes. End of chapter 112 Chapter 113 At the beginning of the last week in August Philip entered upon his duties in the district. They were arduous, for he had to attend an average of three confinements a day. The patient had obtained a card from the hospital some time before, and when her time came it was taken to the porter by a messenger, generally a little girl, who was then sent across the road to the house in which Philip lodged. At night the porter, who had a latch-key, himself came over and awoke Philip. It was mysterious then to get up in the darkness and walk through the deserted streets of the south side. At those hours it was generally the husband who brought the card. If there had been a number of babies before, he took it for the most part with surly indifference, but if newly married, he was nervous and then sometimes strove to allay his anxiety by getting drunk. Often there was a mile or more to walk 
during which Philip and the messenger discussed the conditions of labor and the costs of living. Philip learnt about the various trades which were practiced on that side of the river. He inspired confidence in the people among whom he was thrown, and during the long hours that he waited in a stuffy room, the woman in labor lying on a large bed that took up half of it, her mother and the midwife talked to him as naturally as they talked to one another. The circumstances in which he had lived during the last two years had taught him several things about the life of the very poor which it amused them to find he knew, and they were impressed because he was not deceived by their little subterfuges. He was kind, and he had gentle hands, and he did not lose his temper. They were pleased because he was not above drinking a cup of tea with them, and when the dawn came and they were still waiting they offered him a slice of bread and dripping. He was not squeamish and could eat most things now with a good appetite. Some of the houses he went to in filthy courts off a dingy street huddled against one another without light or air were merely squalid, but others unexpectedly, though dilapidated with worm-eaten floors and leaking roofs, had the grand air. You found in them oak balusters exquisitely carved, and the walls had still their paneling. These were thickly inhabited. One family lived in each room, and in the daytime there was the incessant noise of children playing in the court. The old walls were the breeding place of vermin. The air was so foul that often, feeling sick, Philip had to light his pipe. The people who dwelt here lived from hand to mouth. Babies were unwelcome. The man received them with surly anger. The mother would despair. It was one more mouth to feed, and there was little enough wherewith to feed those already there. Philip often discerned the wish that the child might be born dead or might die quickly. He delivered one woman of twins, a source of humor to the facetious, and when she was told she burst into a long, shrill wail of misery. Her mother said outright, I don't know how they're going to feed em. Maybe the Lord'll see fit to take em to himself, said the midwife. Philip caught sight of the husband's face as he looked at the tiny pair lying side by side, and there was a ferocious sullenness in it which startled him. He felt in the family assembled there was a hideous resentment against those poor atoms who had come into the world unwished for and he had a suspicion that if he did not speak firmly an accident would occur. Accidents occurred often. Mothers overlaid their babies, and perhaps errors of diet were not always the result of carelessness. "'I shall come every day,' he said. "'I warn you that if anything happens to them there'll have to be an inquest.' The father made no reply, but he gave Philip a scowl. There was murder in his soul." "'Bless their little arts,' said the grandmother. "'What should happen to them?' The great difficulty was to keep the mothers in bed for ten days, which was the minimum upon which the hospital practice insisted. It was awkward to look after the family, no one would see to the children without payment, and the husband tumbled because his tea was not right when he came home tired from his work and hungry. Philip had heard that the poor helped one another, but woman after woman complained to him that she could not get anyone in to clean up and see to the children's dinner without paying for the service, and she could not afford to pay. By listening to the women as they talked, and by chance remarks from which he could deduce much that was left unsaid, Philip learned how little there was in common between the poor and the classes above them. They did not envy their betters, for the life was too different and they had an ideal of ease which made the existence of the middle classes seem formal and stiff. Moreover, they had a certain contempt for them because they were soft and did not work with their hands. The proud merely wished to be left alone, but the majority looked upon the well-to-do as people to be exploited. They knew what to say in order to get such advantages as the charitable put at their disposal and they accepted benefits as a right which came to them from the folly of their superiors and their own astuteness. They bore the curate with contemptuous indifference, but the district visitor excited their bitter hatred. She came in and opened your windows without so much as a by your leave or with your leave, and me with my bronchitis enough to give me my death a cold. She poked her nose into corners, and if she didn't say the place was dirty you saw what she thought right enough 
and it's all very well for them as as servants, but I'd like to see what she'd make of her own room if she had four children and had to do the cooking and mend their clothes and wash them. Philip discovered that the greatest tragedy of life to these people was not separation or death, that was natural, and the grief of it could be assuaged with tears, but loss of work. He saw a man come home one afternoon, three days after his wife's confinement, and tell her he had been dismissed. He was a builder, and at that time work was slack. He stated the fact and sat down to his tea. "'Oh, Jim,' she said. The man ate stolidly some mess which had been stewing in a saucepan against his coming. He stared at his plate. His wife looked at him two or three times with little startled glances, and then quite suddenly began to cry. The builder was an uncouth little fellow with a rough weather-beaten face and a long white scar on his forehead. He had large stubbly hands. Presently he pushed aside his plate as if he must give up the effort to force himself to eat, and turned a fixed gaze out of the window. The room was at the top of the house at the back, and one saw nothing but sullen clouds. The silence seemed heavy with despair. Philip felt that there was nothing to be said, he could only go, and as he walked away wearily, for he had been up most of the night, his heart was filled with rage against the cruelty of the world. He knew the hopelessness of the search for work and the desolation which is harder to bear than hunger. He was thankful not to have to believe in God, for then such a condition of things would be intolerable. One could reconcile oneself to existence only because it was meaningless. It seemed to Philip that the people who spent their time in helping the poorer classes erred because they sought to remedy things which would harass them if themselves had to endure them without thinking that they did not in the least disturb those who were used to them. The poor did not want large airy rooms. They suffered from cold, for their food was not nourishing and their circulation bad. Space gave them a feeling of chilliness, and they wanted to burn as little coal as need be. There was no hardship for several to sleep in one room. They preferred it. They were never alone for a moment from the time they were born till the time they died, and loneliness oppressed them. They enjoyed the promiscuity in which they dealt, and the constant noise of their surroundings pressed upon their ears unnoticed. They did not feel the need of taking a bath constantly, and Philip often heard them speak with indignation of the necessity to do so with which they were faced on entering the hospital. It was both an affront and a discomfort. They wanted chiefly to be left alone. Then, if the man was in regular work, life went easily and was not without its pleasures. There was plenty of time for gossip. After the day's work a glass of beer was very good to drink. The streets were a constant source of entertainment. If you wanted to read, there was Reynolds or the News of the World. But there you couldn't make out how the time did fly. The truth was, and that's a fact, you was a rare one for reading when you was a girl but what with one thing and another you didn't get no time now not even to read the paper. The usual practice was to pay three visits after a confinement, and one Sunday Philip went to see a patient at the dinner hour. She was up for the first time. I couldn't stay in bed no longer. I really couldn't. I'm not one for idling, and it gives me the fidgets to be there and do nothing all day long. So I said to Herb, I'm just going to get up and cook your dinner for you. Herb was sitting at table with his knife and fork already in his hands. He was a young man with an open face and blue eyes. He was earning good money, and as things went the couple were in easy circumstances. They had only been married a few months and were both delighted with the rosy boy who lay in the cradle at the foot of the bed. There was a savory smell of beefsteak in the room, and Philip's eyes turned to the range. "'I was just going to dish up this minute,' said the woman. Fire away, said Philip. I'll just have a look at the sun and air, and then I'll take myself off. Husband and wife laughed at Philip's expression, and Herb, getting up, went over with Philip to the cradle. He looked at his baby proudly. There doesn't seem much wrong with him, does there? said Philip. He took up his hat, and by this time Herb's wife had dished up the beefsteak and put on the table a plate of green peas. You're going to have a nice dinner, smiled Philip. He's only in of a Sunday, and I like to have something special for him, so as he shall miss his own when he's out at work, 
"'I suppose you'd be above sitting down and having a bit of dinner with us?' said Herb. "'Oh, Herb,' said his wife in a shocked tone. "'Not if you ask me,' answered Philip, with his attractive smile. "'Well, that's just what I call friendly. I knew he wouldn't take no offense, Polly. Just get another plate, my girl.' Polly was flustered, and she thought Herb a regular caution. You never knew what eyes he'd get in his head next. But she got a plate and wiped it quickly with her apron, then took a new knife and fork from the chest of drawers where her best cutlery rested among her best clothes. There was a jug of stout on the table, and Herb poured Philip out a glass. He wanted to give him the lion's share of the beefsteak, but Philip insisted that they should share alike. It was a sunny room with two windows that reached to the floor. It had been the parlor of a house which at one time was, if not fashionable, at least respectable. It might have been inhabited fifty years before by a well-to-do tradesman or by an officer on half-pay. Herb had been a football player before he married, and there were photographs on the wall of various teams in self-conscious attitudes, with neatly plastered hair, the captain seated proudly in the middle holding a cup. There were other signs of prosperity, photographs of the relations of Herb and his wife in Sunday clothes, on the chimney-piece an elaborate arrangement of shells stuck on a miniature rock, and on each side mugs, a present from South End in Gothic letters with pictures of a pier and a parade on them. Herb was something of a character. He was a non-union man and expressed himself with indignation at the efforts of the union to force him to join. The union wasn't no good to him, he never found no difficulty in getting work, and there was good wages for anyone as had a head on his shoulders and wasn't above putting his hand to anything as come his way. Polly was timorous. If she was him, she joined the union. The last time there was a strike she was expecting him to be brought back in an ambulance every time he went out. She turned to Philip. He's that obstinate. There's no doing anything with him. Well, what I say is, it's a free country and I won't be dictated to. It's no good saying it's a free country, said Polly. That won't prevent them bashing your ad in if they get the chance. When they had finished, Philip passed his pouch over to Herb and they lit their pipes. Then he got up, for a call might be waiting for him at his rooms, and shook hands. He saw that it had given them pleasure that he shared their meal, and they saw that he had thoroughly enjoyed it. "'Well, good-bye, sir,' said Herb, "'and I hope we shall have as nice a doctor next time the missus disgraces herself.' "'Go on with you, Herb,' she retorted. "'How do you know there's going to be a next time?' End of chapter 113 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters one fourteen through one seventeen of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter one fourteen. The three weeks which the appointment lasted drew to an end. Philip had attended sixty-two cases, and he was tired out. When he came home about ten o'clock on his last night he hoped with all his heart that he would not be called out again. He had not had a whole night's rest for ten days. The case which he had just come from was horrible. He had been fetched by a huge burly man, the worse for liquor, and taken to a room in an evil-smelling court which was filthier than any he had seen. It was a tiny attic. Most of the space was taken up by a wooden bed with a canopy of dirty red hangings, and the ceiling was so low that Philip could touch it with the tips of his fingers. With the solitary candle that afforded what light there was he went over it, frizzling up the bugs that crawled upon it. The woman was a blousy creature of middle age who had had a long succession of stillborn children. It was a story that Philip was not unaccustomed to. The husband had been a soldier in India. The legislation forced upon that country by the prudery of the English public had given a free run to the most distressing of all diseases. The innocent suffered. Yawning, Philip undressed and took a bath, then shook his clothes over the water and watched the animals that fell out, wriggling. He was just going to get into bed when there was a knock at the door 
and the hospital porter brought him a card. "'Curse you,' said Philip. "'You're the last person I wanted to see tonight. Who's brought it?' "'I think it's the husband, sir. Shall I tell him to wait?' Philip looked at the address, saw that the street was familiar to him, and told the porter that he would find his own way. He dressed himself and in five minutes, with his black bag in his hand, stepped into the street. A man, whom he could not see in the darkness, came up to him and said he was the husband. "'I thought I'd better wait, sir,' he said. "'It's a pretty rough neighborhood, and them not knowin' who you was.' Philip laughed. "'Bless your heart. They all know the doctor. I've been in some damn sight rougher places than Waver Street.' It was quite true. The black bag was a passport through wretched alleys and down foul-smelling courts into which a policeman was not ready to venture by himself. Once or twice a little group of men had looked at Philip curiously as he passed. He heard a mutter of observations, and then one say, "'It's the hospital doctor.' As he went by one or two of them said, "'Good night, sir.' "'We shall have to step out if you don't mind, sir,' said the man who accompanied him now. They told me there was no time to lose. "'Why did you leave it so late?' asked Philip as he quickened his pace. He glanced at the fellow as they passed the lamppost. "'You look awfully young,' he said. "'I'm turned eighteen, sir.' He was fair, and he had not a hair on his face. He looked no more than a boy. He was short but thick-set. "'You're young to be married,' said Philip. "'We add to. How much do you earn?' Sixteen, sir. Sixteen shillings a week was not much to keep a wife and child on. The room the couple lived in showed that their poverty was extreme. It was a fair size, but it looked quite large, since there was hardly any furniture in it. There was no carpet on the floor, there were no pictures on the walls, and most rooms had something, photographs or supplements in cheap frames from the Christmas numbers of the illustrated papers. The patient lay on a little iron bed of the cheapest sort. It startled Philip to see how young she was. "'By Jove, she can't be more than sixteen, he said to the woman who had come in to see her through. She had given her age as eighteen on the card, but when they were very young they often put on a year or two. Also she was pretty, which was rare in those cases in which the constitution had been undermined by bad food, bad air, and unhealthy occupations. She had delicate features and large blue eyes, and a mass of dark hair done in the elaborate fashion of the coaster girl. She and her husband were very nervous. "'You'd better wait outside so as to be at hand if I want you,' Philip said to him. Now that he saw him better, Philip was surprised again at his boyish air. You felt that he should be larking in the street with the other lads instead of waiting anxiously for the birth of a child. The hours passed and it was not till nearly two that the baby was born. Everything seemed to be going satisfactorily. The husband was called in, and it touched Philip to see the awkward, shy way in which he kissed his wife. Philip packed up his things. Before going he felt once more his patient's pulse. "'Hello,' he said. He looked at her quickly. Something had happened. In cases of emergency the S.O.C., senior obstetric clerk, had to be sent for. He was a qualified man, and the district was in his charge. Philip scribbled a note and, giving it to the husband, told him to run with it to the hospital. He bade him hurry, for his wife was in a dangerous state. The man set off. Philip waited anxiously. He knew the woman was bleeding to death. He was afraid she would die before his chief arrived. He took what steps he could. He hoped fervently that the S.O.C. would not have been called elsewhere. The minutes were interminable. He came at last, and, while he examined the patient, in a low voice asked Philip questions. Philip saw by his face that he thought the case very grave. His name was Chandler. He was a tall man of few words, with a long nose and a thin face much lined for his age. He shook his head. It was hopeless from the beginning. Where's the husband? I told him to wait on the stairs, said Philip. You'd better bring him in. Philip opened the door and called him. He was sitting in the dark on the first step of the flight that led to the next floor. He came up to the bed. What's the matter? he asked. Why, there's internal bleeding. It's impossible to stop it. The S.O.C. hesitated a moment, 
and because it was a painful thing to say he forced his voice to become brusque. "'She's dying.' The man did not say a word. He stopped quite still, looking at his wife who lay pale and unconscious on the bed. It was the midwife who spoke. "'The gentlemen have done all they could, Arry, she said. "'I saw what was coming from the first. "'Shut up,' said Chandler. There were no curtains on the windows, and gradually the night seemed to lighten. It was not yet the dawn, but the dawn was at hand. Chandler was keeping the woman alive by all the means in his power, but life was slipping away from her, and suddenly she died. The boy who was her husband stood at the end of the cheap iron bed with his hands resting on the rail. He did not speak, but he looked very pale, and once or twice Chandler gave him an uneasy glance, thinking he was going to faint. His lips were gray. The midwife sobbed noisily, but he took no notice of her. His eyes were fixed upon his wife, and in them was an utter bewilderment. He reminded you of a dog whipped for something he did not know was wrong. When Chandler and Philip had gathered together their things, Chandler turned to the husband. You'd better lie down for a bit. I expect you're about done up. There's nowhere for me to lie down, sir, he answered, and there was in his voice a humbleness which was very distressing. Don't you know anyone in the house who'll give you a shakedown? No, sir. They only moved in last week, said the midwife. They don't know nobody yet. Chandler hesitated a moment awkwardly, then he went up to the man and said, I'm very sorry this has happened. He held out his hand, and the man, with an instinctive glance at his own to see if it was clean, shook it. Thank you, sir. Philip shook hands with him, too. Chandler told the midwife to come and fetch the certificate in the morning. They left the house and walked along together in silence. "'It upsets one a bit at first, doesn't it?' said Chandler at last. "'A bit,' answered Philip. "'If you like, I'll tell the porter not to bring you any more calls tonight. I'm off duty at eight in the morning in any case. How many cases have you had?' Sixty-three. Good, you'll get your certificate then. They arrived at the hospital, and the S.O.C. went in to see if anyone wanted him. Philip walked on. It had been very hot all the day before, and even now in the early morning there was a bombiness in the air. The street was very still. Philip did not feel inclined to go to bed. It was the end of his work, and he need not hurry. He strolled along, glad of the fresh air, and the silence. He thought that he would go on to a bridge and look at daybreak on the river. A policeman at the corner bade him good morning. He knew who Philip was from his bag. "'Out late tonight, sir,' he said. Philip nodded and passed. He leaned against the parapet and looked towards the morning. At that hour the great city was like a city of the dead. The sky was cloudless, but the stars were dim at the approach of day. There was a light mist on the river and the great buildings on the north side were like palaces in an enchanted island. A group of barges was moored in midstream. It was all of an unearthly violent, troubling somehow, and awe-inspiring. But quickly everything grew pale and cold and gray. Then the sun rose, a ray of yellow gold stole across the sky, and the sky was iridescent. Philip could not get out of his eyes the dead girl lying on the bed wan and white, and the boy who stood at the end of it like a stricken beast. The bareness of the squalid room made the pain of it more poignant. It was cruel that a stupid chance should have cut off her life when she was just entering upon it. But in the very moment of saying this to himself, Philip thought of the life which had been in store for her, the bearing of children, the dreary fight with poverty, the youth broken by toil and deprivation into a slatternly middle age. He saw the pretty face grow thin and white, the hair grow scanty, the pretty hands, worn down brutally by work, become like the claws of an old animal. Then, when the man was past his prime, the difficulty of getting jobs, the small wages he had to take, and the inevitable abject penury of the end. She might be energetic, thrifty, industrious, it would not have saved her. 
in the end was the workhouse or subsistence on the charity of her children. Who could pity her because she had died when life offered so little? But pity was inane. Philip felt it was not that which these people needed. They did not pity themselves. They accepted their fate. It was the natural order of things. Otherwise, good heavens! Otherwise they would swarm over the river in their multitude to the side where those great buildings were, secure and stately, and they would pillage, burn, and sack. But the day, tender and pale, had broken now, and the mist was tenuous. It bathed everything in a soft radiance, and the Thames was gray, rosy, and green, gray like mother of pearl, and green like the heart of a yellow rose. The wharves and storehouses of the Surrey side were massed in disorderly loveliness. The scene was so exquisite that Philip's heart beat passionately. He was overwhelmed by the beauty of the world. Beside that, nothing seemed to matter. End of chapter 114 Chapter 115 Philip spent the few weeks that remained before the beginning of the winter session in the outpatients department, and in October settled down to regular work. He had been away from the hospital for so long that he found himself very largely among new people. The men of different years had little to do with one another, and his contemporaries were now mostly qualified. Some had left to take up assistantships or posts in country hospitals and infirmaries, and some held appointments at St. Luke's. The two years during which his mind had lain fallow had refreshed him, he fancied, and he was able now to work with energy. The Athelnys were delighted with his change of fortune. He had kept aside a few things from the sale of his uncle's effects and gave them all presents. He gave Sally a gold chain that had belonged to his aunt. She was now grown up. She was apprenticed to a dressmaker and set out every morning at eight to work all day in a shop in Regent Street. Sally had frank blue eyes, a broad brow, and plentiful shining hair. She was buxom with broad hips and full breasts, and her father, who was fond of discussing her appearance, warned her constantly that she must not grow fat. She attracted because she was healthy, animal, and feminine. She had many admirers, but they left her unmoved. She gave one the impression that she looked upon love-making as nonsense and it was easy to imagine that young men found her unapproachable. Sally was old for her years. She had been used to help her mother in household work and in the care of the children, so that she had acquired a managing air which made her mother say that Sally was a bit too fond of having things her own way. She did not speak very much, but as she grew older she seemed to be acquiring a quiet sense of humor and sometimes uttered a remark which suggested that beneath her impassive exterior she was quietly bubbling with amusement at her fellow creatures. Philip found that with her he never got on the terms of affectionate intimacy upon which he was with the rest of Athelny's huge family. Now and then her indifference slightly irritated him. There was something enigmatic in her. When Philip gave her the necklace, Athelny, in his boisterous way, insisted that she must kiss him. But Sally reddened and drew back. "'No, I'm not going to,' she said. "'Ungrateful hussy!' cried Athelny. "'Why not?' "'I don't like being kissed by men,' she said. Philip saw her embarrassment and, amused, turned Athelny's attention to something else. That was never a very difficult thing to do. But evidently her mother spoke of the matter lately, for next time Philip came, she took the opportunity, when they were alone, for a couple of minutes to refer to it. "'You didn't think it was disagreeable of me last week when I wouldn't kiss you?' "'Not a bit,' he laughed. "'It's not because I wasn't grateful.' She blushed a little as she uttered the formal phrase which she had prepared. "'I shall always value the necklace, and it was very kind of you to give it to me.' Philip found it always a little difficult to talk to her. She did all that she had to do very competently but seemed to feel no need of conversation, yet there was nothing unsociable in her. One Sunday afternoon when Athelny and his wife had gone out together, and Philip, treated as one of the family, sat reading in the parlor, Sally came in and sat by the window to sew. The girls' clothes were made at home, and Sally could not afford to spend Sundays in idleness. Philip thought she wished to talk, 
and put down his book. "'Go on reading,' she said. "'I only thought as you were alone I'd come and sit with you.' "'You're the most silent person I've ever struck,' said Philip. "'We don't want another one who's talkative in this house,' she said. There was no irony in her tone. She was merely stating a fact but it suggested to Philip that she measured her father, alas, no longer the hero he was to her childhood, and in her mind joined together his entertaining conversation and the thriftlessness which often brought difficulties into their life. She compared his rhetoric with her mother's practical common sense, and though the liveliness of her father amused her, she was perhaps sometimes a little impatient with it. Philip looked at her as she bent over her work, she was healthy, strong, and normal. It must be odd to see her among the other girls in the shop with their flat chest and anemic faces. Mildred suffered from anemia. After a time it appeared that Sally had a suitor. She went out occasionally with friends she had made in the workroom and had met a young man, an electrical engineer in a very good way of business, who was a most eligible person. One day she told her mother that he had asked her to marry him. "'What did you say?' said her mother. "'Oh, I told him I wasn't over-anxious to marry anyone just yet a while.' She paused a little, as was her habit, between observations. "'He took on so that I said he might come to tea on Sunday. It was an occasion that thoroughly appealed to Athelny. He rehearsed all the afternoon how he should play the heavy father for the young man's edification, till he reduced his children to helpless giggling. Just before he was due, Athelny rooted out an Egyptian tarbouche and insisted on putting it on. "'Go on with you, Athelny,' said his wife, who was in her very best, which was of black velvet, and, since she was growing stouter every year, very tight for her. You'll spoil the girl's chances.' She tried to pull it off, but the little man skipped nimbly out of her way. "'Unhand me, woman!' nothing will induce me to take it off. This young man must be shown at once that it is no ordinary family he is preparing to enter. Let him keep it on, mother, said Sally in her even, indifferent fashion. If Mr. Donaldson doesn't take it the way it's meant, he can take himself off, and good riddance. Philip thought it was a severe ordeal that the young man was being exposed to, since Athelny in his brown velvet jacket, flowing black tie, and red tarbouche, was a startling spectacle for an innocent electrical engineer. When he came he was greeted by his host with the proud courtesy of a Spanish grandee and by Mrs. Athelny in an altogether homely and natural fashion. They sat down at the old ironing-table in the high-backed monkish chairs, and Mrs. Athelny poured tea out of a luster teapot which gave a note of England and the countryside to the festivity. She made little cakes with her own hand and on the table was homemade jam. It was a farmhouse tea, and to Philip very quaint and charming in that Jacobean house. Athelny, for some fantastic reason, took it into his hand to discourse upon Byzantine history. He had been reading the later volumes of The Decline and Fall, and his forefinger, dramatically extended, he poured into the astonished ears of the suitor scandalous stories about Theodora and Irene. He addressed himself directly to his guest with a torrent of rhodomontade, and the young man, reduced to helpless silence and shy, nodded his head at intervals to show that he took an intelligent interest. Mrs. Athelny paid no attention to Thorpe's conversation, but interrupted now and then to offer the young man more tea or to press upon him cake and jam. Philip watched Sally. She sat with downcast eyes, calm, silent, and observant and her long eyelashes cast a pretty shadow on her cheek. You could not tell whether she was amused at the scene or if she cared for the young man. She was inscrutable. But one thing was certain. The electrical engineer was good-looking, fair and clean-shaven, with pleasant regular features and an honest face. He was tall and well-made. Philip could not help thinking he would make an excellent mate for her and he felt a pang of envy for the happiness which he fancied was in store for them. Presently the suitor said he thought it was about time he was getting along. Sally rose to her feet without a word and accompanied him to the door. When she came back her father burst out. "'Well, Sally, we think your young man very nice. We are prepared to welcome him into our family. 
Let the bonds be called, and I will compose a nuptial song. Sally set about clearing away the tea things. She did not answer. Suddenly she shot a swift glance at Philip. What did you think of him, Mr. Philip? She had always refused to call him Uncle Phil, as the other children did, and would not call him Philip. I think you'd make an awfully handsome pair. She looked at him quickly once more, and then with a slight blush went on with her business. I thought him a very nice, civil-spoken young fellow, said Mrs. Athelny, and I think he's just the sort to make any girl happy. Sally did not reply for a minute or two, and Philip looked at her curiously. It might be thought that she was meditating upon what her mother had said, and, on the other hand, she might be thinking of the man in the moon. "'Why don't you answer when you're spoken to, Sally?' remarked her mother, a little irritably. "'I thought he was a silly. Are you not going to have him, then?' "'No, I'm not. I don't know how much more you want,' said Mrs. Athelny, and it was quite clear now that she was put out. "'He's a very decent young fellow, and he can afford to give you a thorough good home. We've got quite enough to feed here without you. If you get a chance like that it's wicked not to take it, and I dare say you'll be able to have a girl to do the rough work.' Philip had never before heard Mrs. Athelny refer so directly to the difficulties of her life. He saw how important it was that each child should be provided for. "'It's no good your carrying on, mother,' said Sally in her quiet way. "'I'm not going to marry him. I think you're a very hard-hearted, cruel, selfish girl. If you want me to earn my own living, mother, I can always go into service. Don't be so silly. You know your father would never let you do that. Philip caught Sally's eye, and he thought there was in it a glimmer of amusement. He wondered what there had been in the conversation to touch her sense of humor. She was an odd girl. End of chapter 115 Chapter 116 During his last year at St. Luke's, Philip had to work hard. He was contented with life. He found it very comfortable to be heart-free and to have enough money for his needs. He had heard people speak contemptuously of money. He wondered if they had ever tried to do without it. He knew that the lack made a man petty, mean, grasping. It distorted his character and caused him to view the world from a vulgar angle. When you had to consider every penny, money became of grotesque importance. You needed a competency to rate it at its proper value. He lived a solitary life, seeing no one except the Athelnys, but he was not lonely. He busied himself with plans for the future, and sometimes he thought of the past. His recollection dwelt now and then on old friends, but he made no effort to see them. He would have liked to know what was become of Nora Nesbitt. She was Nora something else now, but he could not remember the name of the man she was going to marry. He was glad to have known her. She was a good and brave soul. One evening, about half-past eleven, he saw Lawson walking along Piccadilly. He was in evening clothes and might be supposed to be coming back from a theatre. Philip gave way to a sudden impulse and quickly turned down a side street. He had not seen him for two years and felt that he could not now take up again the interrupted friendship. He and Lawson had nothing more to say to one another. Philip was no longer interested in art. It seemed to him that he was able to enjoy beauty with greater force than when he was a boy, but art appeared to him unimportant. He was occupied with the forming of a pattern out of the manifold chaos of life, and the materials with which he worked seemed to make preoccupation with pigments and words very trivial. Lawson had served his turn. Philip's friendship with him had been a motive in the design he was elaborating. It was merely sentimental to ignore the fact that the painter was of no further interest to him. Sometimes Philip thought of Mildred. He avoided deliberately the streets in which there was a chance of seeing her, but occasionally some feeling, perhaps curiosity, perhaps something deeper which he could not acknowledge, made him wander about Piccadilly and Regent Street during the hours when she might be expected to be there. He did not know, then, whether he wished to see her or dreaded it. Once he saw a back which reminded him of hers, and for a moment 
he thought it was she. It gave him a curious sensation. It was a strange, sharp pain in his heart. There was fear in it and a sickening dismay. And when he hurried on and found that he was mistaken, he did not know whether it was relief that he experienced or disappointment. At the beginning of August Philip passed his surgery, his last examination, and received his diploma. It was seven years since he had entered St. Luke's Hospital. He was nearly thirty. He walked down the stairs of the Royal College of Surgeons with the roll in his hand which qualified him to practice, and his heart beat with satisfaction. Now I'm really going to begin life, he thought. Next day he went to the secretary's office to put his name down for one of the hospital appointments. The secretary was a pleasant little man with a black beard whom Philip had always found very affable. He congratulated him on his success and then said, "'I suppose you'd like to do a locum for a month on the south coast? Three guineas a week with board and lodging.' "'I wouldn't mind,' said Philip. "'It's at Farnley in Dorsetshire, Dr. South. You'd have to go down at once. His assistant has developed mumps. I believe it's a very pleasant place.' There was something in the secretary's manner that puzzled Philip. It was a little doubtful. "'What's the crab in it?' he asked. The secretary hesitated a moment and laughed in a conciliating fashion. "'Well, the fact is, I understand he's rather a crusty, funny old fellow. The agencies won't send him any one any more. He speaks his mind very openly, and men don't like it. But do you think he'll be satisfied with a man who's only just qualified?' After all, I have no experience. He ought to be glad to get you, said the secretary diplomatically. Philip thought for a moment. He had nothing to do for the next few weeks, and he was glad of the chance to earn a bit of money. He could put it aside for the holiday in Spain which he had promised himself when he had finished his appointment at St. Luke's, or if they would not give him anything there, at some other hospital. All right, I'll go. The only thing is, you must go this afternoon. Will that suit you? If so, I'll send a wire at once. Philip would have liked a few days to himself, but he had seen the Athelnys the night before, he had gone at once to take them his good news, and there was really no reason why he should not start immediately. He had little luggage to pack. Soon after seven that evening he got out of the station at Farnley and took a cab to Dr. South's. It was a broad, low, stucco house, with a Virginia creeper growing over it. He was shown into the consulting room. An old man was writing at a desk. He looked up as the maid ushered Philip in. He did not get up, and he did not speak. He merely stared at Philip. Philip was taken aback. "'I think you're expecting me,' he said. "'The secretary of St. Luke's wired to you this morning. I kept dinner back for half an hour. Do you want to wash?' I do, said Philip. Dr. South amused him by his odd manner. He got up now, and Philip saw that he was a man of middle height, thin, with white hair cut very short, and a long mouth closed so tightly that he seemed to have no lips at all. He was clean-shaven but for small white whiskers, and they increased the squareness of face which his firm jaw gave him. He wore a brown tweed suit and a white stock. His clothes hung loosely about him as though they had been made for a much larger man. He looked like a respectable farmer of the middle of the nineteenth century. He opened the door. "'There is the dining-room,' he said, pointing to the door opposite. "'Your bedroom is the first door you come to when you get on the landing. Come downstairs when you're ready.' During dinner Philip knew that Dr. South was examining him but he spoke little, and Philip felt that he did not want to hear his assistant talk. "'When were you qualified?' he asked suddenly. "'Yesterday.' "'Were you at a university?' "'No.' "'Last year, when my assistant took a holiday, they sent me a varsity man. I told him not to do it again. Two damned gentlemen lay for me.' There was another pause. The dinner was very simple and very good. Philip preserved a sedate exterior but in his heart he was bubbling over with excitement. He was immensely elated at being engaged as a locum. It made him feel extremely grown up. He had an insane desire to laugh at nothing in particular, and the more he thought of his professional dignity, the more he was inclined to chuckle. 
but Dr. South broke suddenly into his thoughts. "'How old are you?' "'Getting on for thirty. "'How is it you're only just qualified? "'I didn't go in for medical till I was nearly twenty-three, "'and I had to give it up for two years in the middle. "'Why? "'Poverty.' Dr. South gave him an odd look and relapsed into silence. At the end of the dinner he got up from the table. "'Do you know what sort of a practice this is?' "'No,' answered Philip mostly fishermen and their families. I have the Union and the Seamen's Hospital. I used to be alone here, but since they tried to make this into a fashionable seaside resort, a man has set up on the cliff, and the well-to-do people go to him. I only have those who can't afford to pay for a doctor at all. Philip saw that the rivalry was a sore point with the old man. You know that I have no experience, said Philip. You none of you know anything." He walked out of the room without another word and left Philip by himself. When the maid came in to clear away she told Philip that Dr. South saw patients from six till seven. Work for that night was over. Philip fetched a book from his room, lit his pipe, and settled himself down to read. It was a great comfort since he had read nothing but medical books for the last few months. At ten o'clock Dr. South came in and looked at him. Philip hated not to have his feet up, and he had dragged up a chair for them. "'You seem to make yourself pretty comfortable,' said Dr. South, with a grimness which would have disturbed Philip if he had not been in such high spirits. Philip's eyes twinkled as he answered, "'Have you any objection?' Dr. South gave him a look, but did not reply directly. "'What's that you're reading?' "'Peregrine Pickle, Smollett.' "'I happen to know that Smollett wrote Peregrine Pickle?' I beg your pardon. Medical men aren't much interested in literature, are they? Philip had put the book on the table, and Dr. South took it up. It was a volume of an edition which had belonged to the vicar of Blackstable. It was a thin book bound in faded Morocco, with the copper plate engraving as a frontispiece. The pages were musty with age and stained with mold. Philip, without meaning to, started forward a little as Dr. South took the volume in his hands and a slight smile came into his eyes. Very little escaped the old doctor. "'Do I amuse you?' he asked icily. "'I see you're fond of books. You can always tell by the way people handle them.' Dr. South put down the novel immediately. "'Breakfast at eight-thirty,' he said, and left the room. "'What a funny old fellow,' thought Philip. He soon discovered why Dr. South's assistants found it difficult to get on with him. In the first place, he set his face firmly against all the discoveries of the last thirty years. He had no patience with the drugs which became modish, were thought to work marvelous cures, and in a few years were discarded. He had stock mixtures which he had brought from St. Luke's where he had been a student and had used all his life. He found them just as efficacious as anything that had come into fashion since. Philip was startled at Dr. Sal's suspicion of asepsis. He had accepted it in deference to universal opinion, but he used the precautions which Philip had known insisted upon so scrupulously at the hospital with the disdainful tolerance of a man playing at soldiers with children. I've seen antiseptics come along and sweep everything before them, and then I've seen asepsis take their place. Bunk em. The young men who were sent down to him knew only hospital practice and they came with the unconcealed scorn for the general practitioner which they had absorbed in the air at the hospital, but they had seen only the complicated cases which appeared in the wards. They knew how to treat an obscure disease of the suprarenal bodies, but were helpless when consulted for a cold in the head. Their knowledge was theoretical, and their self-assurance unbounded. Dr. South watched them with tightened lips. He took a savage pleasure in showing them how great was their ignorance and how unjustified their conceit. It was a poor practice of fishing folk, and the doctor made up his own prescriptions. Dr. South asked his assistant how he expected to make both ends meet if he gave a fisherman with a stomach ache a mixture consisting of half a dozen expensive drugs. He complained, too, that the young medical men were uneducated. Their reading consisted of the Sporting Times and the British Medical Journal. They could neither write a legible hand nor spell correctly. 
For two or three days Dr. South watched Philip closely, ready to fall on him with acid sarcasm if he gave him the opportunity, and Philip, aware of this, went about his work with a quiet sense of amusement. He was pleased with the change of occupation. He liked the feeling of independence and of responsibility. All sorts of people came to the consulting room. He was gratified because he seemed able to inspire his patients with confidence, and it was entertaining to watch the process of cure which at a hospital necessarily could be watched only at distant intervals. His rounds took him into low-roofed cottages in which were fishing tackle and sails, and here and there mementos of deep-sea traveling, a lacquer box from Japan, spears and oars from Melanesia, or daggers from the bazaars of Stamboul. There was an air of romance in the stuffy little rooms, and the salt of the sea gave them a bitter freshness. Philip liked to talk to the sailor men, and when they found that he was not supercilious they told him long yarns of the distant journeys of their youth. Once or twice he made a mistake in diagnosis. He had never seen a case of measles before, and when he was confronted with the rash took it for an obscure disease of the skin and once or twice his ideas of treatment differed from Dr. South. The first time this happened Dr. South attacked him with savage irony, but Philip took it with good humor. He had some gift for repartee, and he made one or two answers which caused Dr. South to stop and look at him curiously. Philip's face was grave, but his eyes were twinkling. The old gentleman could not avoid the impression that Philip was chafing him. He was used to being disliked and feared by his assistants, and this was a new experience. He had half a mind to fly into a passion and pack Philip off by the next train. He had done that before with his assistants. But he had an uneasy feeling that Philip then would simply laugh at him outright, and suddenly he felt amused. His mouth formed itself into a little smile against his will, and he turned away. In a little while, he grew conscious that Philip was amusing himself systematically at his expense. He was taken aback at first, and then diverted. Damn his impotence, he chuckled to himself. Damn his impotence! End of chapter 116 Chapter 117 Philip had written to Athelny to tell him that he was doing a locum in Dorsetshire, and in due course received an answer from him. It was in the formal manner he affected, studded with pompous epithets, as a Persian diadem was studded with precious stones, and in the beautiful hand, like black letter and as difficult to read, upon which he prided himself. He suggested that Philip should join them and his family in the Kentish hopfield to which he went every year, and to persuade him said various beautiful and complicated things about Philip's soul and the winding tendrils of the hops. Philip replied at once that he would come on the first day he was free. Though not born there, he had a peculiar affection for the Isle of Thanet, and he was fired with enthusiasm at the thought of spending a fortnight so close to the earth and amid conditions which needed only a blue sky to be as idyllic as the olive groves of Arcady. The four weeks of his engagement at Farnley passed quickly. On the cliff a new town was springing up with red-brick villas round golf links, and a large hotel had recently been opened to cater for the summer visitors. But Philip went there seldom. Down below, by the harbor, the little stone houses of a past century were clustered in a delightful confusion, and the narrow streets climbing down steeply had an air of antiquity which appealed to the imagination. By the water's edge were neat cottages with trim, tiny gardens in front of them. They were inhabited by retired captains in the merchant service, and by mothers or widows of men who had gained their living by the sea. And they had an appearance which was quaint and peaceful. In the little harbor came tramps from Spain and the Levant, ships of small tonnage, and now and then a windjammer was borne in by the winds of romance. It reminded Philip of the dirty little harbor with its colliers at Blackstable, and he thought that there he had first acquired the desire, which was now an obsession, for eastern lands and sunlit islands in a tropic sea. But here you felt yourself closer to the wide, deep ocean than on the shore of that North Sea which seemed always circumscribed. Here you could draw a long breath 
as you looked out upon the even vastness, and the west wind, the dear soft salt wind of England, uplifted the heart and at the same time melted it to tenderness. One evening, when Philip had reached his last week with Dr. South, a child came to the surgery door while the old doctor and Philip were making up prescriptions. It was a little ragged girl with a dirty face and bare feet. Philip opened the door. "'Please, sir, will you come to Mrs. Fletcher's in Ivy Lane at once?' "'What's the matter with Mrs. Fletcher?' called out Dr. South in his rasping voice. The child took no notice of him, but addressed herself again to Philip. "'Please, sir, her little boy's had an accident, and will you come at once?' "'Tell Mrs. Fletcher I'm coming,' called out Dr. South. The little girl hesitated for a moment, and putting a dirty finger in a dirty mouth stood still and looked at Philip. "'What's the matter, kid?' said Philip, smiling. "'Please, sir, Mrs. Fletcher says, will the new doctor come?' There was a sound in the dispensary and Dr. South came out into the passage. "'Isn't Mrs. Fletcher satisfied with me?' he barked. "'I've attended Mrs. Fletcher since she was born. Why aren't I good enough to attend her filthy brat?' The girl looked for a moment as though she were going to cry. Then she thought better of it. She put out her tongue deliberately at Dr. South, and, before he could recover from his astonishment, folded off as fast as she could run. Philip saw that the old gentleman was annoyed. "'You look rather fagged, and it's a goodish way to Ivy Lane,' he said, by way of giving him an excuse not to go himself. Dr. South gave a low snarl. "'It's a damn sight nearer for a man who's got the use of both legs than for a man who's only got one and a half.' Philip reddened and stood silent for a while. "'Do you wish me to go, or will you go yourself?' he said at last frigidly. "'What's the good of my going? They want you.' Philip took up his hat and went to see the patient. It was hard upon eight o'clock when he came back. Dr. South was standing in the dining-room with his back to the fireplace. "'You've been gone a long time,' he said. "'I'm sorry. Why didn't you start dinner?' "'Because I chose to wait. Have you been all this while at Mrs. Fletcher's?' "'No, I'm afraid I haven't. I stopped to look at the sunset on my way back, and I didn't think of the time.' Dr. South did not reply and the servant brought in some grilled sprats. Philip ate them with an excellent appetite. Suddenly Dr. South shot a question at him. "'Why did you look at the sunset?' Philip answered with his mouth full. "'Because I was happy.' Dr. South gave him an odd look, and the shadow of a smile flickered across his old tired face. They ate the rest of the dinner in silence, but when the maid had given them the port and left the room, the old man leaned back and fixed his sharp eyes on Philip. "'It stung you up a bit when I spoke of your game leg, young fellow,' he said. "'People always do, directly or indirectly, when they get angry with me. I suppose they know it's your weak point.' Philip faced him and looked at him steadily. "'Are you very glad to have discovered it?' The doctor did not answer, but he gave a chuckle of bitter mirth. They sat for a while, staring at one another. Then Dr. South surprised Philip extremely. "'Why don't you stay here and I'll get rid of that damned fool with his mumps?' "'It's very kind of you, but I hope to get an appointment at the hospital in the autumn. It'll help me so much in getting other work later.' "'I'm offering you a partnership,' said Dr. South grumpily. "'Why?' asked Philip with a surprise. "'They seem to like you down here.' "'I didn't think that was a fact which altogether met with your approval.' said Philip dryly. "'Do you suppose that after forty years' practice I care a two-penny damn whether people prefer my assistant to me? No, my friend, there's no sentiment between my patients and me. I don't expect gratitude from them. I expect them to pay my fees. Well, what do you say to it?' Philip made no reply, not because he was thinking over the proposal, but because he was astonished. It was evidently very unusual for someone to offer a partnership to a newly qualified man, and he realized with wonder that, although nothing would induce him to say so, Dr. South had taken a fancy to him. He thought how amused the secretary at St. Luke's would be when he told him. The practice brings in about seven hundred a year. We can reckon out how much your share would be, and you can pay me off my degrees and when I die you can succeed me. I think that's better than knocking about hospitals for two or three years 
and then taking assistance ships until you can afford to set up for yourself. Philip knew that it was a chance that most people in his profession would jump at. The profession was overcrowded, and half the men he knew would be thankful to accept the certainty of even so modest a competence as that. "'I'm awfully sorry, but I can't,' he said. "'It means giving up everything I've aimed at for years. In one way or another I've had a roughish time, but I always had that one hope before me to get qualified so that I might travel. And now, when I wake up in the morning, my bones simply ache to get off. I don't mind where particularly, but just away to places I'd never been to. Now the goal seemed very near. He would have finished his appointment at St. Luke's by the middle of the following year, and then he would go to Spain. He could afford to spend several months there, rambling up and down the land which stood to him for romance. After that he would get a ship and go to the east. Life was before him and time of no account. He could wander for years if he chose in unfrequented places amid strange peoples where life was led in strange ways. He did not know what he sought or what his journeys would bring him, but he had a feeling that he would learn something new about life and gain some clue to the mystery that he had solved only to find more mysterious. And even if he found nothing he would allay the unrest which gnawed at his heart. But Dr. South was showing him a great kindness, and it seemed ungrateful to refuse his offer for no adequate reason. So, in his shy way, trying to appear as matter-of-fact as possible, he made some attempt to explain why it was so important to him to carry out the plans he had cherished so passionately. Dr. South listened quietly, and a gentle look came into his shrewd old eyes. It seemed to Philip an added kindness that he did not press him to accept his offer. Benevolence is often very peremptory. He appeared to look upon Philip's reasons as sound. Dropping the subject, he began to talk of his own youth. He had been in the Royal Navy, and it was his long connection with the sea that, when he retired, had made him settle at Farnley. He told Philip of old days in the Pacific and of wild adventures in China. He had taken part in an expedition against the headhunters of Borneo, and had known Samoa when it was still an independent state. He had touched at Coral Islands. Philip listened to him entranced. Little by little he told Philip about himself. Dr. South was a widower. His wife had died thirty years before, and his daughter had married a farmer in Rhodesia. He had quarreled with him, and she had not come to England for ten years. It was just as if he had never had wife or child. He was very lonely. His gruffness was little more than a protection which he wore to hide a complete disillusionment, and to Philip it seemed tragic to see him just waiting for death, not impatiently, but rather with loathing for it, hating old age and unable to resign himself to its limitations, and yet with the feeling that death was the only solution of the bitterness of his life. Philip crossed his path, and the natural affection which long separation from his daughter had killed, she had taken her husband's part in the quarrel, and her children he had never seen, settled itself upon Philip. At first it made him angry. He told himself it was a sign of dotage, but there was something in Philip that attracted him, and he found himself smiling at him he knew not why. Philip did not bore him. Once or twice he put his hand on his shoulder. It was as near a caress as he had got since his daughter left England so many years before. When the time came for Philip to go, Dr. South accompanied him to the station. He found himself unaccountably depressed. "'I've had a ripping time here,' said Philip. "'You've been awfully kind to me. I suppose you're very glad to go? I've enjoyed myself here. But you want to get out into the world.' Ah, you have youth. He hesitated a moment. I want you to remember that if you change your mind, my offer still stands. That's awfully kind of you. Philip shook hands with him out of the carriage window, and the train steamed out of the station. Philip thought of the fortnight he was going to spend in the hop field. He was happy at the idea of seeing his friends again, and he rejoiced because the day was fine but Dr. South walked slowly 
back to his empty house. He felt very old and very lonely. End of chapter 117 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters one eighteen through one twenty of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter one eighteen. It was late in the evening when Philip arrived at Fern. It was Mrs. Athelny's native village, and she had been accustomed from her childhood to pick up in the hop-field to which with her husband and children she still went every year. Like many Kentish folk her family had gone out regularly, glad to earn a little money, but especially regarding the annual outing looking forward to for months as the best of holidays. The work was not hard, it was done in common, in the open air, and for the children it was a long delightful picnic. Here the young men met the maidens. In the long evenings when work was over they wandered about the lanes making love, and the hopping season was generally followed by weddings. They went out in carts with bedding, pots and pans, chairs and tables, and Fern, while the hopping lasted, was deserted. They were very exclusive and would have resented the intrusion of foreigners, as they called the people who came from London. They looked down upon them and feared them, too. They were a rough lot and the respectable country folk did not want to mix with them. In the old days the hoppers slept in barns, but ten years ago a row of huts had been erected at the side of a meadow, and the Athelnys, like many others, had the same hut every year. Athelny met Philip at the station in a cart he had borrowed from the public house at which he had got a room for Philip. It was a quarter of a mile from the hop-field. They left his bag there and walked over to the meadow in which were the huts. They were nothing more than a long, low shed divided into rooms about twelve feet square. In front of each was a fire of sticks round which a family was grouped, eagerly watching the cooking of supper. The sea air and the sun had browned already the faces of Athelny's children. Mrs. Athelny seemed a different woman in her sunbonnet you felt that the long years in the city had made no real difference to her. She was the countrywoman born and bred, and you could see how much at home she found herself in the country. She was frying bacon and at the same time keeping an eye on the younger children, but she had a hearty handshake and a jolly smile for Philip. Athelny was enthusiastic over the delights of a rural existence. We're starved for sun and light in the cities we live in. It isn't life, it's a long imprisonment. Let us sell all we have, Betty, and take a farm in the country. I can see you in the country, she answered with good-humoured scorn. Why, the first rainy day we had in the winter you'd be crying for London. She turned to Philip. Athelny's always like this when we come down here. Country, I like that. Why, he don't know a Swede from a mangle wurzel. Daddy was lazy today, remarked Jane with the frankness which characterized her. He didn't fill one bin. I'm getting into practice, child, and tomorrow I shall fill more bins than all of you put together. Come and eat your supper, children, said Mrs. Athelny. Where's Sally? Here I am, mother. She stepped out of their little hut, and the flames of the wood fire leaped up and cast sharp color upon her face. Of late Philip had only seen her in the trim frock she had taken to since she was at the dressmaker's, and there was something very charming in the print dress she wore now loose and easy to work in. The sleeves were tucked up and showed her strong round arms. She, too, had a sunbonnet. "'You look like a milkmaid in a fairy story,' said Philip, as he shook hands with her. "'She's the belle of the hop-fields,' said Athelny. "'My word, if the squire's son sees you he'll make an offer of marriage before you can say Jack Robinson.' "'The squire hasn't got a son, father,' said Sally. She looked about for a place to sit down in, and Philip made room for her beside him. She looked wonderful in the night lit by wood fires. She was like some rural goddess, and you thought of those fresh, strong girls whom old Herrick had praised in exquisite numbers. The supper was simple, 
bread and butter, crisp bacon, tea for the children, and beer for Mr. and Mrs. Athelny and Philip. Athelny, eating hungrily, praised loudly all he ate. He flung words of scorn at Lucullus and piled invectives upon Bria Savaran. "'There's one thing you can say for you, Athelny,' said his wife. "'You do enjoy your food, and no mistake. Cooked by your hand, my Betty,' he said, stretching out an eloquent forefinger. Philip felt himself very comfortable. He looked happily at the line of fires with people grouped about them and the color of the flames against the night. At the end of the meadow was a line of great elms and above the starry sky. The children talked and laughed, and Athelny, a child among them, made them roar by his tricks and fancies. "'They think a rare lot of Athelny down here,' said his wife. "'Why, Mrs. Bridges said to me, I don't know what we should do without Mr. Athelny now,' she said. "'He's always up to something. He's more like a schoolboy than the father of a family.' Sally sat in silence, but she attended to Philip's once in a thoughtful fashion that charmed him. It was pleasant to have her beside him, and now and then he glanced at her sunburned, healthy face. Once he caught her eyes, and she smiled quietly. When supper was over, Jane and a small brother were sent down to a brook that ran at the bottom of the meadow to fetch a pail of water for washing up. "'You children, show your Uncle Philip where we sleep, and then you must be thinking of going to bed.' Small hands seized Philip, and he was dragged towards the hut. He went in and struck a match. There was no furniture in it, and besides a tin box in which clothes were kept, there was nothing but the beds. There were three of them, one against each wall. Athelny followed Philip in and showed them proudly. "'That's the stuff to sleep on,' he cried none of your spring mattresses and swans down. I never sleep so soundly anywhere as here. You will sleep between sheets. My dear fellow, I pity you from the bottom of my soul. The beds consisted of a thick layer of hop vine, on the top of which was a coating of straw, and this was covered with a blanket. After a day in the open air, with the aromatic scent of the hops all round them, the happy pickers slept like tops. By nine o'clock all was quiet in the meadow, and everyone in bed but one or two men who still lingered in the public-house and would not come back till it was closed at ten. Athelny walked there with Philip, but before he went Mrs. Athelny said to him, "'We breakfast about a quarter to six, but I dare say you won't get up as early as that. You see, we have to set to work at six. "'Of course he must get up early,' cried Athelny, "'and he must work like the rest of us.' He's got to earn his board. No work, no dinner, my lad. The children go down to bathe before breakfast, and they can give you a call on their way back. They pass the jolly sailor. If they'll wake me, I'll come and bathe with them, said Philip. Jane and Harold and Edward shouted with the delight at the prospect, and next morning Philip was awakened out of a sound sleep by their bursting into his room. The boys jumped on his bed, and he had to chase them out with his slippers. He put on a coat and a pair of trousers and went down. The day had only just broken, and there was a nip in the air. But the sky was cloudless, and the sun was shining yellow. Sally, holding Connie's hand, was standing in the middle of the road with a towel and a bathing dress over her arm. He saw now that her sunbonnet was of the color of lavender, and against it her face, red and brown, was like an apple. She greeted him with her slow, sweet smile and he noticed suddenly that her teeth were small and regular and very white. He wondered why they had never caught his attention before. "'I was for letting you sleep on,' she said, "'but they would go up and wake you. I said you didn't really want to come. Oh, yes, I did.' They walked down the road and then cut across the marshes. That way it was under a mile to the sea. The water looked cold and gray, and Philip shivered at the sight of it but the others tore off their clothes and ran in shouting. Sally did everything a little slowly, and she did not come into the water till all the rest were splashing round Philip. Swimming was his only accomplishment. He felt at home in the water, and soon he had them all imitating him as he played at being a porpoise and a drowning man and a fat lady afraid of wetting her hair. The bath was uproarious, and it was necessary for Sally to be very severe to induce them all to come out. "'You're as bad as any of them,' she said to Philip in her grave maternal way 
which was at once comic and touching. They're not anything like so naughty when you're not here. They walked back, Sally with her bright hair streaming over one shoulder and her sunbonnet in her hand, but when they got to the huts Mrs. Athelny had already started for the hop garden. Athelny, in a pair of the oldest trousers anyone had ever worn, his jacket buttoned up to show he had no shirt on, and in a wide-brimmed soft hat was frying kippers over a fire of sticks. He was delighted with himself. He looked every inch a brigand. As soon as he saw the party he began to shout the witch's chorus from Macbeth over the odorous kippers. "'You mustn't dawdle over your breakfast or mother will be angry,' he said when they came up. And in a few minutes Harold and Jane, with pieces of bread and butter in their hands, they sauntered through the meadow into the hop-field. They were the last to leave. A hop-garden was one of the sights connected with Philip's boyhood and the oast-houses to him the most typical feature of the Kentish scene. It was with no sense of strangeness, but as though he were at home, that Philip followed Sally through the long lines of the hops. The sun was bright now and cast a sharp shadow. Philip feasted his eyes on the richness of the green leaves. The hops were yellowing, and to him they had the beauty and the passion which poets in Sicily have found in the purple grape. As they walked along Philip felt himself overwhelmed by the rich luxuriance. A sweet scent arose from the fat Kentish soil, and the fitful September breeze was heavy with the goodly perfume of the hops. Athelstan felt the exhilaration instinctively, for he lifted up his voice and sang. It was the cracked voice of a boy of fifteen, and Sally turned round. "'You be quiet, Athelstan, or we shall have a thunderstorm.' In a moment they heard the hum of voices, and in a moment more came upon the pickers. They were all hard at work, talking and laughing as they picked. They sat on chairs, on stools, on boxes with their baskets by their sides, and some stood by the bin throwing the hops they picked straight into it. There were a lot of children about, and a good many babies, some in makeshift cradles, some tucked up in a rug on the soft brown dry earth. The children picked a little and played a great deal. The women worked busily. They had been pickers from childhood, and they could pick twice as fast as foreigners from London. They boasted about the number of bushels they had picked in a day, but they complained you could not make money now as in former times. Then they paid you a shilling for five bushels, but now the rate was eight and even nine bushels to the shilling. In the old days a good picker could earn enough in the season to keep her for the rest of the year, but now there was nothing in it. You got a holiday for nothing, and that was about all. Mrs. Hill had bought herself a piano out of what she made picking, so she said, but she was very near, one wouldn't like to be near like that, and most people thought it was only what she said. If the truth was known, perhaps it would be found that she had put a bit of money from the savings bank towards it. The hoppers were divided into bin companies of ten pickers, not counting children, and Athelny loudly boasted of the day when he would have a company consisting entirely of his own family. Each company had a bin man, whose duty it was to supply it with strings of hops at their bins. The bin was a large sack, on a wooden frame about seven feet high, and long rows of them were placed between the rows of hops, and it was to this position that Athelny aspired when his family was old enough to form a company. Meanwhile he worked rather by encouraging others than by exertions of his own. He sauntered up to Mrs. Athelny, who had been busy for half an hour, and had already emptied a basket into the bin, and with his cigarette between his lips began to pick. He asserted that he was going to pick more than anyone that day but Mother. Of course no one could pick as much as Mother. That reminded him of the trials which Aphrodite put upon the curious psyche, and he began to tell his children the story of her love for the unseen bridegroom. He told it very well. It seemed to Philip, listening with a smile on his lips, that the old tale fitted in with the scene. The sky was very blue now, and he thought it could not be more lovely even in Greece. The children with their fair hair and rosy cheeks, strong, healthy, and vivacious, the delicate form of the hops, the challenging emerald of the leaves like a blare of trumpets, the magic of the green alley narrowing to a point as you looked down the row with the pickers in their sunbonnets, 
perhaps there was more of the Greek spirit there than you could find in the books of professors or in museums. He was thankful for the beauty of England. He thought of the winding white roads and the hedgerows, the green meadows with their elm trees, the delicate line of the hills and the copses that crowned them, the flatness of the marshes and the melancholy of the North Sea. He was very glad that he felt its loveliness. But presently Athelny grew restless and announced that he would go and ask how Robert Kemp's mother was. He knew everyone in the garden and called them all by their Christian names. He knew their family histories and all that had happened to them from birth. With harmless vanity he played the fine gentleman among them, and there was a touch of condescension in his familiarity. Philip would not go with him. "'I'm going to earn my dinner,' he said. "'Quite right, my boy,' answered Athelny, with a wave of the hand as he strolled away. "'No work, no dinner.'" End of chapter 118 Chapter 119 Philip had not a basket of his own, but sat with Sally. Jane thought it monstrous that he should help her elder sister rather than herself, and he had to promise to pick for her when Sally's basket was full. Sally was almost as quick as her mother. "'Won't it hurt your hands for sewing?' asked Philip. "'Oh, no, it wants soft hands. That's why women pick better than men. If your hands are hard and your fingers all stiff with a lot of rough work, you can't pick near so well.' He liked to see her deft movements, and she watched him too now and then with that maternal spirit of hers which was so amusing and yet so charming. He was clumsy at first, and she laughed at him. When she bent over and showed him how best to deal with a whole line their hands met. He was surprised to see her blush. He could not persuade himself that she was a woman. Because he had known her as a flapper he could not help looking upon her as a child still. Yet the number of her admirers showed that she was a child no longer, and though they had only been down for a few days one of Sally's cousins was already so attentive that she had to endure a lot of chaffing. His name was Peter Gahn, and he was the son of Mrs. Athelny's sister who had married a farmer near Fern. Everyone knew why he found it necessary to walk through the hop-field every day. A call-off by the sounding of a horn was made for breakfast at eight, and though Mrs. Athelny told them they had not deserved it, they ate it very heartily. They set to work again and worked till twelve, when the horn sounded once more for dinner. At intervals the measurer went his round from bin to bin, accompanied by the booker who entered first in his own book and then in the hoppers the number of bushels picked. As each bin was filled it was measured out in bushel baskets into a huge bag called a poke and this the measurer and the pole-puller carried off between them and put on the wagon. Athelny came back now and then with stories of how much Mrs. Heath or Mrs. Jones had picked, and he conjured his family to beat her. He was always wanting to make records, and sometimes in his enthusiasm picked steadily for an hour. His chief amusement in it, however, was that it showed the beauty of his graceful hands, of which he was excessively proud he spent much time manicuring them. He told Philip, as he stretched out his tapering fingers, that the Spanish grandees had always slept in oiled gloves to preserve their whiteness. The hand that wrung the throat of Europe, he remarked dramatically, was as shapely and exquisite as a woman's, and he looked at his own as he delicately picked the hops and sighed with self-satisfaction. When he grew tired of this he rolled himself a cigarette and discourse to Philip of art and literature. In the afternoon it grew very hot. Work did not proceed so actively, and conversation halted. The incessant chatter of the morning dwindled now to desultory remarks. Tiny beads of sweat stood on Sally's upper lip, and as she worked her lips were slightly parted. She was like a rosebud bursting into flower. Calling off time depended on the state of the oast house. Sometimes it was filled early, and as many hops had been picked by three or four as could be dried during the night. Then work was stopped. But generally the last measuring of the day began at five. As each company had its bin measured it gathered up its things and, chatting again now that work was over, sauntered out of the garden. The women went back to the huts to clean up and prepare the supper, while a good many of the men strolled down the road to the public house. A glass of beer was very pleasant 
after the day's work. The Athelny's bin was the last to be dealt with. When the measurer came, Mrs. Athelny, with a sigh of relief, stood up and stretched her arms. She had been sitting in the same position for many hours and was stiff. Now, let's go to the jolly sailor, said Athelny. The rites of the day must be duly performed, and there is none more sacred than that. Take a jug with you, Athelny, said his wife, and bring back a pint and a half for supper. She gave him the money, copper by copper. The bar parlor was already well filled. It had a sanded floor, benches round it, and yellow pictures of Victorian prize fighters on the walls. The licensee knew all his customers by name, and he leaned over his bar smiling benignly at two young men who were throwing rings on a stick that stood up from the floor. Their failure was greeted with a good deal of hearty chaff from the rest of the company. Room was made for the new arrivals. Philip found himself sitting between an old laborer in corduroys with string tied under his knees and a shiny-faced lad of seventeen with a love-lock neatly plastered on his red forehead. Athelny insisted on trying his hand at the throwing of rings. He backed himself for half a pint and won it. As he drank the loser's health, he said, "'I would sooner have won this than won the derby, my boy.' He was an outlandish figure, with his wide-brimmed hat and pointed beard among those country folk, and it was easy to see that they thought him very queer. But his spirits were so high, his enthusiasm so contagious, that it was impossible not to like him. Conversation went easily. A certain number of pleasantries were exchanged in the broad, slow accent of the Isle of Thanet, and there was uproarious laughter at the sallies of the local wag. A pleasant gathering. It would have been a hard-hearted fellow who did not feel a glow of satisfaction in his fellows. Philip's eyes wandered out of the window where it was bright and sunny still. There were little white curtains in it tied up with red ribbon like those of a cottage window, and on the sill were pots of geraniums. In due course, one by one, the idlers got up and sauntered back to the meadow where supper was cooking. "'I expect you'll be ready for your bed,' said Mrs. Athelny to Philip. "'You're not used to getting up at five and staying in the open air all day.' "'You're coming to bathe with us, Uncle Phil, aren't you?' the boys cried. "'Rather!' He was tired and happy. After supper, balancing himself against the wall of the hut on a chair without a back, he smoked his pipe and looked at the night. Sally was busy. She passed in and out of the hut, and he lazily watched her methodical actions. Her walk attracted his notice. It was not particularly graceful, but it was easy and assured. She swung her legs from the hips, and her feet seemed to tread the earth with decision. Athelny had gone off to gossip with one of the neighbors, and presently Philip heard his wife address the world in general. "'There now, I'm out of tea, and I wanted Athelny to go down to Mrs. Black's and get some.' A pause, and then her voice was raised. "'Sally, just run down to Mrs. Black's and get me half a pound of tea, will you? I've run quite out of it.' "'All right, mother.' Mrs. Black had a cottage about half a mile along the road and she combined the office of postmistress with that of universal provider. Sally came out of the hut, turning down her sleeves. "'Shall I come with you, Sally?' asked Philip. "'Don't you trouble. I'm not afraid to go alone.' "'I didn't think you were, but it's getting near my bedtime, and I was just thinking I'd like to stretch my legs.' Sally did not answer, and they set out together. The road was white and silent. There was not a sound in the summer night. They did not speak much. "'It's quite hot even now, isn't it?' said Philip. "'I think it's wonderful for the time of year.' But their silence did not seem awkward. They found it was pleasant to walk side by side and felt no need of words. Suddenly, at a stile in the hedgerow, they heard a low murmur of voices, and in the darkness they saw the outline of two people. They were sitting very close to one another and did not move as Philip and Sally passed. I wonder who that was, said Sally. They looked happy enough, didn't they? I expect they took us for lovers, too. They saw the light of the cottage in front of them, and in a minute went into the little shop. The glare dazzled them for a moment. You are late, said Mrs. Black. I was just going to shut up. She looked at the clock, getting on for nine. Sally asked for her half-pound of tea. Mrs. Athelny could never bring herself 
to buy more than half a pound at a time, and they set off up the road again. Now and then some beast of the night made a short, sharp sound, but it seemed only to make the silence more marked. "'I believe if you stood still you could hear the sea,' said Sally. They strained their ears, and their fancy presented them with a faint sound of little waves lapping up against the shingle. When they passed the stile again the lovers were still there, but now they were not speaking. They were in one another's arms, and the man's lips were pressed against the girl's. "'They seem busy,' said Sally. They turned a corner, and a breath of warm wind beat for a moment against their faces. The earth gave forth its freshness. There was something strange in the tremulous night, and something you knew not what seemed to be waiting. The silence was on a sudden pregnant with meaning. Philip had a queer feeling in his heart. It seemed very full. It seemed to melt. The hackneyed phrases expressed precisely the curious sensation. He felt happy and anxious and expectant. To his memory came back those lines in which Jessica and Lorenzo murmur melodious words to one another, capping each other's utterance. But passion shines bright and clear through the conceits that amuse them. He did not know what there was in the air that made his senses so strangely alert. It seemed to him that he was pure soul to enjoy the scents and the sounds and the savors of the earth. He had never felt such an exquisite capacity for beauty. He was afraid that Sally by speaking would break the spell, but she said never a word, and he wanted to hear the sound of her voice. Its low richness was the voice of the country night itself. They arrived at the field through which she had to walk to get back to the huts. Philip went in to hold the gate open for her. Well, here I think I'll say good night. Thank you for coming all that way with me. She gave him her hand, and as he took it he said, "'If you were very nice, you'd kiss me good night, like the rest of the family.' "'I don't mind,' she said. Philip had spoken in jest. He merely wanted to kiss her because he was happy, and he liked her, and the night was so lovely. "'Good night, then,' he said, with a little laugh, drawing her towards him. She gave him her lips. They were warm and full and soft. He lingered a little. They were like a flower." Then, he knew not how, without meaning, he flung his arms round her. She yielded quite silently. Her body was firm and strong. He felt her heart beat against his. Then he lost his head. His senses overwhelmed him like a flood of rushing waters. He drew her into the darker shadow of the hedge. End of chapter 119 Chapter 120 Philip slept like a log and awoke with a start to find Harold tickling his face with the feather. There was a shout of delight when he opened his eyes. He was drunken with sleep. "'Come on, lazy bones,' said Jane. "'Sally says she won't wait for you unless you hurry up.' Then he remembered what had happened. His heart sank, and, half out of bed already, he stopped. He did not know how he was going to face her. He was overwhelmed with a sudden rush of self-reproach and bitterly, bitterly, he regretted what he had done. What would she say to him that morning? He dreaded meeting her, and he asked himself how he could have been such a fool. But the children gave him no time. Edward took his bathing drawers and his towel, Athelstan tore the bedclothes away, and in three minutes they all clattered down into the road. Sally gave him a smile. It was as sweet and innocent as it had ever been. "'You do take time to dress yourself she said. I thought you was never coming. There was not a particle of difference in her manner. He had expected some change, subtle or abrupt. He fancied that there would be shame in the way she treated him, or anger, or perhaps some increase of familiarity. But there was nothing. She was exactly the same as before. They walked towards the sea all together, talking and laughing, and Sally was quiet, but she was always that, reserved, but he had never seen her otherwise, and gentle. She neither sought conversation with him nor avoided it. Philip was astounded. He had expected the incident of the night before to have caused some revolution in her, but it was just as though nothing had happened. It might have been a dream, and as he walked along a little girl holding on to one hand and a little boy to the other 
while he chatted as unconcernedly as he could, he sought for an explanation. He wondered whether Sally meant the affair to be forgotten. Perhaps her senses had run away with her just as his had, and, treating what had occurred as an accident due to unusual circumstances, it might be that she had decided to put the matter out of her mind. It was ascribing to her a power of thought and a mature wisdom which fitted neither with her age nor with her character. But he realized that he knew nothing of her. There had been in her always something enigmatic. They played leapfrog in the water, and the bath was as uproarious as on the previous day. Sally mothered them all, keeping a watchful eye on them and calling to them when they went out too far. She swam steadily backwards and forwards while the others got up to their larks and now and then turned on her back to float. Presently she went out and began drying herself. She called to the others more or less peremptorily, and at last only Philip was left in the water. He took the opportunity to have a good hard swim. He was more used to the cold water this second morning, and he reveled in its salt freshness. It rejoiced him to use his limbs freely, and he covered the water with long, firm strokes. But Sally, with a towel round her, went down to the water's edge. "'You're to come out this minute, Philip,' she called, as though he were a small boy under her charge. And when, smiling with amusement at her authoritative way, he came towards her, she upbraided him. "'It is naughty of you to stay in so long. Your lips are quite blue, and just look at your teeth. They're chattering.' "'All right, I'll come out. She had never talked to him in that manner before. It was as though what had happened gave her a sort of right over him, and she looked upon him as a child to be cared for. In a few minutes they were dressed, and they started to walk back. Sally noticed his hands. "'Just look, they're quite blue. Oh, it's all right, it's only the circulation. I shall get the blood back in a minute. Give them to me.' She took his hands in hers and rubbed them, first one, and then the other till the color returned. Philip, touched and puzzled, watched her. He could not say anything to her on account of the children, and he did not meet her eyes, but he was sure they did not avoid his purposely. It just happened that they did not meet. And during the day there was nothing in her behavior to suggest a consciousness in her that anything had passed between them. Perhaps she was a little more talkative than usual. When they were all sitting again in the hop-field, she told her mother how naughty Philip had been in not coming out of the water till he was blue with cold. It was incredible, and yet it seemed that the only effect of the incident of the night before was to arouse in her a feeling of protection towards him. She had the same instinctive desire to mother him as she had with regard to her brothers and sisters. It was not till the evening that he found himself alone with her. She was cooking the supper, and Philip was sitting on the grass by the side of the fire. Mrs. Athelny had gone down to the village to do some shopping, and the children were scattered in various pursuits of their own. Philip hesitated to speak. He was very nervous. Sally attended to her business with serene competence, and she accepted placidly the silence which to him was so embarrassing he did not know how to begin. Sally seldom spoke unless she was spoken to or had something particular to say. At last he could not bear it any longer. "'You're not angry with me, Sally?' he blurted out suddenly. She raised her eyes quietly and looked at him without emotion. "'Me? No. Why should I be?' He was taken aback and did not reply. She took the lid off the pot, stirred the contents, and put it on again. A savory smell spread over the air. She looked at him once more with a quiet smile which barely separated her lips. It was more a smile of the eyes. "'I always liked you,' she said. His heart gave a great thump against his ribs, and he felt the blood rushing to his cheeks. He forced a faint laugh. "'I didn't know that. That's because you're a silly. I don't know why you liked me. I don't either.' She put a little more wood on the fire. I knew I liked you that day when you came when you'd been sleeping out and hadn't had anything to eat. Do you remember? And me and mother, we got Thorpe's bed ready for you. He flushed again, for he did not know that she was aware of that incident. 
he remembered it himself with horror and shame. "'That's why I wouldn't have anything to do with the others. You remember that young fellow mother wanted me to have? I let him come to tea because he bothered me so, but I knew I'd say no.' Philip was so surprised that he found nothing to say. There was a queer feeling in his heart. He did not know what it was, unless it was happiness. Sally stirred the pot once more. I wish those children would make haste and come. I don't know where they've got to. Supper's ready now. Shall I go and see if I can find them? said Philip. It was a relief to talk about practical things. Well, it wouldn't be a bad idea, I must say. There's mother coming. Then, as he got up, she looked at him without embarrassment. Shall I come for a walk with you tonight when I put the children to bed? Yes. Well, you wait for me down by the stile, and I'll come when I'm ready. He waited under the stars, sitting on the stile, and the hedges with their ripening blackberries were high on each side of him. From the earth rose rich scents of the night, and the air was soft and still. His heart was beating madly. He could not understand anything of what happened to him. He associated passion with cries and tears and vehemence, and there was nothing of this in Sally. But he did not know what else but passion could have caused her to give herself but passion for him? He would not have been surprised if she had fallen to her cousin, Peter Gahn, tall, spare, and straight, with his sunburned face and long, easy stride. Philip wondered what she saw in him. He did not know if she loved him as he reckoned love. And yet he was convinced of her purity. He had a vague inkling that many things had combined, things that she felt though was unconscious of, the intoxication of the air and the hops, and the night, the healthy instincts of the natural woman, a tenderness that overflowed, and an affection that had in it something maternal and something sisterly, and she gave all she had to give because her heart was full of charity. He heard a step on the road, and a figure came out of the darkness. Sally, he murmured. She stopped and came to the stile, and with her came sweet, clean odors of the countryside. She seemed to carry with her sense of the new-mown hay and the savor of ripe hops and the freshness of young grass. Her lips were soft and full against his, and her lovely strong body was firm within his arms. "'Milk and honey,' he said. "'You're like milk and honey.' He made her close her eyes and kissed her eyelids, first one and then the other. Her arm, strong and muscular, was bare to the elbow. He passed his hand over it and wondered at its beauty. It gleamed in the darkness. She had the skin that Rubens painted, astonishingly fair and transparent, and on one side were little golden hairs. It was the arm of a Saxon goddess, but no immortal had that exquisite homely naturalness, and Philip thought of a cottage garden with the dear flowers which bloom in all men's hearts, of the hollyhock and the red and white rose which is called York and Lancaster and of love in a mist and sweet William and honeysuckle, larkspur, and London pride. "'How can you care for me?' he said. "'I'm insignificant and crippled and ordinary and ugly.' She took his face in both her hands and kissed his lips. "'You're an old silly. That's what you are,' she said. End of chapter 120 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters 121 through 122 of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 121. When the hops were picked, Philip, with the news in his pocket that he had got the appointment as assistant house physician at St. Luke's, accompanied the Athelneys back to London. He took modest rooms in Westminster, and at the beginning of October entered upon his duties. The work was interesting and varied. Every day he learned something new. He felt himself of some consequence, and he saw a good deal of Sally. He found life uncommonly pleasant. He was free about six except on the days on which he had outpatients, 
and then he went to the shop at which Sally worked to meet her when she came out. There were several young men who hung about opposite the trade entrance or a little further along at the first corner, and the girls coming out two and two or in little groups nudged one another and giggled as they recognized them. Sally in her plain black dress looked very different from the country lass who had picked hops side by side with him. She walked away from the shop quickly, but she slackened her pace when they met and greeted him with her quiet smile. They walked together through the busy street. He talked to her of his work at the hospital and she told him what she had been doing in the shop that day. He came to know the names of the girls she worked with. He found that Sally had a restrained but keen sense of the ridiculous, and she made remarks about the girls or the men who were set over them, which amused him by their unexpected drollery. She had a way of saying a thing which was very characteristic, quite gravely, as though there were nothing funny in it at all, and yet it was so sharp-sighted that Philip broke into delighted laughter. Then she would give him a little glance in which the smiling eyes showed she was not unaware of her own humor. They met with a handshake and parted as formally. Once Philip asked her to come and have tea with him in his rooms, but she refused. No, I won't do that. It would look funny. Never a word of love passed between them. She seemed not to desire anything more than the companionship of those walks. Yet Philip was positive that she was glad to be with him. She puzzled him as much as she had done at the beginning. He did not begin to understand her conduct, but the more he knew her, the fonder he grew of her. She was competent and self-controlled, and there was a charming honesty in her. You felt that you could rely upon her in every circumstance. You are an awfully good sort, he said to her once a propos of nothing at all. I expect I'm just the same as everyone else," she answered. He knew that he did not love her. It was a great affection that he felt for her, and he liked her company. It was curiously soothing, and he had a feeling for her which seemed to him ridiculous to entertain towards a shop-girl of nineteen. He respected her, and he admired her magnificent healthiness. She was a splendid animal, without defect, and physical perfection filled him always with admiring awe. She made him feel unworthy. Then one day, about three weeks after they had come back to London as they walked together, he noticed that she was unusually silent. The serenity of her expression was altered by a slight line between the eyebrows. It was the beginning of a frown. "'What's the matter, Sally?' he asked. She did not look at him, but straight in front of her, and her color darkened. I don't know. He understood at once what she meant. His heart gave a sudden quick beat, and he felt the color leave his cheeks. What do you mean? Are you afraid that— He stopped. He could not go on. The possibility that anything of the sort could happen had never crossed his mind. Then he saw that her lips were trembling, and she was trying not to cry. I'm not certain yet. Perhaps it'll be all right. They walked on in silence till they came to the corner of Chancery Lane, where he always left her. She held out her hand and smiled. "'Don't worry about it yet. Let's hope for the best.' He walked away with a tumult of thoughts in his head. What a fool he had been! That was the first thing that struck him, an abject, miserable fool, and he repeated it to himself a dozen times in a rush of angry feeling. He despised himself. How could he have got into such a mess?' but at the same time, for his thoughts chased one another through his brain and yet seemed to stand together in a hopeless confusion, like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in a nightmare, he asked himself what he was going to do. Everything was so clear before him, all he had aimed at so long within reach at last, and now his inconceivable stupidity had erected this new obstacle. Philip had never been able to surmount what he acknowledged was a defect in his resolute desire for a well-ordered life, and that was his passion for living in the future. And no sooner was he settled in his work at the hospital than he had busied himself with arrangements for his travels. In the past he had often tried not to think too circumstantially of his plans for the future. It was only discouraging. But now that his goal was so near 
he saw no harm in giving away to a longing that was so difficult to resist. First of all he meant to go to Spain. That was the land of his heart, and by now he was imbued with its spirit, its romance and color and history and grandeur. He felt that it had a message for him in particular which no other country could give. He knew the fine old cities already as though he had trodden their torturous streets from childhood. Cordova, Seville, Toledo, Leon, Tarragona, Burgas. The great painters of Spain were the painters of his soul, and his pulse beat quickly as he pictured his ecstasy on standing face to face with those works which were more magnificent than any others to his own tortured, restless heart. He had read the great poets more characteristic of their race than the poets of other lands, for they seemed to have drawn their inspiration not at all from the general currents of the world's literature, but directly from the torrid, scented plains and the bleak mountains of their own country. A few short months now, and he would hear with his own ears all around him the language which seemed most apt for grandeur of soul and passion. His fine taste had given him an inkling that Andalusia was too soft and sensuous, a little vulgar even, to satisfy his ardor, and his imagination dwelt more willingly among the wind-swept distances of Castile and the rugged magnificence of Aragon and Leon. He did not quite know what those unknown contacts would give him, but he felt that he would gather from them a strength and a purpose which would make him more capable of affronting and comprehending the manifold wonders of places more distant and more strange. For this was only a beginning. He had got into communication with the various companies which took surgeons out on their ships, and knew exactly what were their routes, and from men who had been on them what were the advantages and disadvantages of each line. He put aside the Orient and the P&O. It was difficult to get a berth with them, and besides their passenger traffic allowed the medical officer little freedom, but there were other services which sent large tramps on leisurely expeditions to the east, stopping at all sorts of ports for various periods, from a day or two to a fortnight, so that you had plenty of time, and it was often possible to make a trip inland. The pay was poor, and the food no more than adequate, so that there was not much demand for the post and a man with a London degree was pretty sure to get one if he applied. Since there were no passengers other than a casual man or so, shipping on business from some out-of-the-way port to another, the life on board was friendly and pleasant. Philip knew by heart the list of places at which they touched, and each one called up in him visions of tropical sunshine and magical color and of a teeming, mysterious, intense life. Life! That was what he wanted. At last he would come to close quarters with life. And perhaps from Tokyo or Shanghai it would be possible to transship into some other line and drip down the islands of the South Pacific. A doctor was useful anywhere. There might be an opportunity to go up country in Burma, and what rich jungles in Sumatra or Borneo might he not visit. He was young still, and time was no object to him. He had no ties in England, no friends. He could go up and down the world for years, learning the beauty and the wonder and the variedness of life. Now this thing had come. He put aside the possibility that Sally was mistaken. He felt strangely certain that she was right. After all, it was so likely. Anyone could see that nature had built her to be the mother of children. He knew what he ought to do. He ought not to let the incident divert him a hair's breadth from his path. He thought of Griffiths. He could easily imagine with what indifference that young man would have received such a piece of news. He would have thought it an awful nuisance, and would at once have taken to his heels like a wise fellow. He would have left the girl to deal with her troubles as best she could. Philip told himself that if this had happened it was because it was inevitable. He was no more to blame than Sally. She was a girl who knew the world and the facts of life, and she had taken the risk with her eyes open. It would be madness to allow such an accident to disturb the whole pattern of his life. He was one of the few people who was acutely conscious of the transitoriness of life, 
and how necessary it was to make the most of it. He would do what he could for Sally. He could afford to give her a sufficient sum of money. A strong man would never allow himself to be turned from his purpose. Philip said all this to himself, but he knew he could not do it. He simply could not. He knew himself. "'I'm so damned weak,' he muttered despairingly. She had trusted him and been kind to him. He simply could not do a thing which, notwithstanding all his reason, he felt was horrible. He knew he would have no peace on his travels if he had the thought constantly with him that she was wretched. Besides, there were her father and mother. They had always treated him well. It was not possible to repay them with ingratitude. The only thing was to marry Sally as quickly as possible. He would write to Dr. South, tell him he was going to be married at once, and say that if his offer still held he was willing to accept it. That sort of practice among poor people was the only one possible for him. There his deformity did not matter, and they would not sneer at the simple manners of his wife. It was curious to think of her as his wife. It gave him a queer, soft feeling, and a wave of emotion spread over him as he thought of the child which was his. He had little doubt that Dr. South would be glad to have him, and he pictured to himself the life he would lead with Sally in the fishing village. They would have a little house within sight of the sea, and he would watch the mighty ships passing to the lands he would never know. Perhaps that was the wisest thing. Cronshaw had told him that the facts of life mattered nothing to him who by the power of fancy held in fee the twin realms of space and time. It was true. Forever wilt thou love and she be fair. His wedding present to his wife would be all his high hopes. Self-sacrifice. Philip was uplifted by its beauty, and all through the evening he thought of it. He was so excited that he could not read. He seemed to be driven out of his rooms into the streets, and he walked up and down Birdcage Walk, his heart throbbing with joy. He could hardly bear his impatience. He wanted to see Sally's happiness when he made her his offer, and if it had not been so late he would have gone to her there and then. He pictured to himself the long evenings he would spend with Sally in the cosy sitting-room, the blinds undrawn so that they could watch the sea, he with his books while she bent over her work, and the shaded lamp made her sweet face more fair. They would talk over the growing child, and when she turned her eyes to his there was in them the light of love, and the fishermen and their wives who were his patients would come to feel a great affection for them, and they in turn would enter into the pleasures and pains of those simple lives. But his thoughts returned to the son who would be his and hers. Already he felt in himself a passionate devotion to it. He thought of passing his hands over his little perfect limbs. He knew he would be beautiful and he would make over to him all his dreams of a rich and varied life. And thinking over the long pilgrimage of his past, he accepted it joyfully. He accepted the deformity which had made life so hard for him. He knew that it had warped his character, but now he saw also that by reason of it he had acquired that power of introspection which had given him so much delight. Without it, he would never have had his keen appreciation of beauty, his passion for art and literature, and his interest in the varied spectacle of life. The ridicule and the contempt which had so often been heaped upon him had turned his mind inward and called forth those flowers which he felt would never lose their fragrance. Then he saw that the normal was the rarest thing in the world. Everyone had some defect, of body or of mind, he thought of all the people he had known. The whole world was like a sick house, and there was no rhyme or reason in it. He saw a long procession, deformed in body and warped in mind, some with illness of the flesh, weak heart or weak lungs, and some with illness of the spirit, languor of will, or a craving for liquor. At this moment he could feel a holy compassion for them all. They were the helpless instruments of blind chance. He could pardon Griffiths for his treachery and Mildred for the pain she had caused him. They could not help themselves. 
the only reasonable thing was to accept the good of men and be patient with their faults. The words of the dying God crossed his memory. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. End of chapter 121 Chapter 122 He had arranged to meet Sally on Saturday in the National Gallery. She was to come there as soon as she was released from the shop and had agreed to lunch with him. Two days had passed since he had seen her, and his exultation had not left him for a moment. It was because he rejoiced in the feeling that he had not attempted to see her. He had repeated to himself exactly what he would say to her and how he should say it. Now his impatience was unbearable. He had written to Dr. South and had in his pocket a telegram from him received that morning. Sacking the mumpish fool. When will you come? Philip walked along Parliament Street. It was a fine day, and there was a bright frosty sun which made the light dance in the street. It was crowded. There was a tenuous mist in the distance, and it softened exquisitely the noble lines of the buildings. He crossed Trafalgar Square. Suddenly his heart gave a sort of twist in his body. He saw a woman in front of him who he thought was Mildred. She had the same figure and she walked with that slight dragging of the feet which was so characteristic of her. Without thinking, but with a beating heart, he hurried till he came alongside, and then, when the woman turned, he saw it was someone unknown to him. It was the face of a much older person with a lined yellow skin. He slackened his pace. He was infinitely relieved, but it was not only relief that he felt. It was disappointment, too. He was seized with horror of himself. Would he never be free from that passion? At the bottom of his heart, notwithstanding everything, he felt that a strange, desperate thirst for that vile woman would always linger. That love had caused him so much suffering that he knew he would never, never quite be free of it. Only death could finally assuage his desire. But he wrenched the pang from his heart. He thought of Sally with her kind blue eyes and her lips unconsciously formed themselves into a smile. He walked up the steps of the National Gallery and sat down in the first room so that he should see her the moment she came in. It always comforted him to get among pictures. He looked at none in particular, but allowed the magnificence of their color, the beauty of their lines, to work upon his soul. His imagination was busy with Sally. It would be pleasant to take her away from that London in which she seemed an unusual figure, like a cornflower in a shop, among orchids and azaleas. He had learned in the Kentish hop-field that she did not belong to the town, and he was sure that she would blossom under the soft skies of Dorset to a rarer beauty. She came in, and he got up to meet her. She was in black, with white cuffs at her wrist, and a lawn collar round her neck. They shook hands. "'Have you been waiting long?' "'No, ten minutes.' are you hungry? Not very. Let's sit here for a bit, shall we? If you like. They sat quietly, side by side, without speaking. Philip enjoyed having her near him. He was warmed by her radiant health. A glow of life seemed like an aureole to shine about her. Well, how have you been? he said at last, with a little smile. Oh, it's all right. It was a false alarm. Was it? aren't you glad? An extraordinary sensation filled him. He had felt certain that Sally's suspicion was well-founded. It had never occurred to him for an instant that there was a possibility of error. All his plans were suddenly overthrown, and the existence so elaborately pictured was no more than a dream which would never be realized. He was free once more. Free. He need give up none of his projects, and life still was in his hands for him to do what he liked with. He felt no exhilaration, but only dismay. His heart sank. The future stretched out before him in desolate emptiness. It was as though he had sailed for many years over a great waste of waters, with peril and privation, and at last had come upon a fair haven, but as he was about to enter, some contrary wind had arisen and drove him out again into the open sea. 
and because he had let his mind dwell on these soft meads and pleasant woods of the land, the vast deserts of the ocean filled him with anguish. He could not confront again the loneliness and the tempest. Sally looked at him with her clear eyes. "'Aren't you glad?' she asked again. "'I thought you'd be as pleased as Punch.' He met her gaze haggardly. "'I'm not sure,' he muttered. "'You are funny. Most men would.' He realized that he had deceived himself. It was no self-sacrifice that had driven him to think of marrying, but the desire for a wife, and a home, and love. And now that it all seemed to slip through his fingers, he was seized with despair. He wanted all that more than anything in the world. What did he care for Spain and its cities, Cordova, Toledo, Leon? What to him were the pagodas of Burma, and the lagoons of South Sea Islands. America was here and now. It seemed to him that all his life he had followed the ideals that other people, by their words or their writings, had instilled into him, and never the desires of his own heart. Always his course had been swayed by what he thought he should do, and never by what he wanted with his whole soul to do. He put all that aside now with a gesture of impatience. He had always lived in the future, and the present always had slipped through his fingers. His ideals? He thought of his desire to make a design, intricate and beautiful, out of the myriad meaningless facts of life. Had he not seen also that the simplest pattern, that in which a man was born, worked, married, had children and died, was likewise the most perfect? It might be that to surrender to happiness was to accept defeat, but it was a defeat better than many victories. He glanced quickly at Sally. He wondered what she was thinking, and then looked away again. "'I was going to ask you to marry me,' he said. "'I thought perhaps you might, but I shouldn't have liked to stand in your way. You wouldn't have done that. How about your travels, Spain and all that? How do you know I want to travel?' I ought to know something about it. I've heard you and Dad talk about it till you were blue in the face. I don't care a damn about all that. He paused for an instant, and then spoke in a low, hoarse whisper. I don't want to leave you. I can't leave you. She did not answer. He could not tell what she thought. I wonder if you'll marry me, Sally. She did not move, and there was no flicker of emotion on her face. But she did not look at him when she answered. If you like. Don't you want to? Oh, of course I'd like to have a house of my own, and it's about time I was settling down. She smiled a little. He knew her pretty well by now, and her manner did not surprise him. But don't you want to marry me? There's no one else I would marry. Then that settles it. Mother and Dad will be surprised, won't they? I'm so happy. I want my lunch, she said. Dear, he smiled and took her hand and pressed it. They got up and walked out of the gallery. They stood for a moment at the balustrade and looked at Trafalgar Square. Cabs and omnibuses hurried to and fro, and crowds passed, hastening in every direction, and the sun was shining. This is the end of Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks.com.